Please, it's time indeed. Yeah, that's what they were saying. Uh, here we are at long last, uh, artistes as we are, having prepared prepared ourselves for this to get through this great work of art. Uh, for the so, deepest... l- let me just jump in and say uh, this is a very unusual uh, edition of the Deepest Law because our host and friend, academic agent, uh, has chosen not to join us. He's he's producing the stream. Uh, but he he won't be directly joining us, so we're running the stream ourselves. Um, and this was um, a, 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 this was a last minute substitute for an uh, a, an expected fourth Batman stream. I, the Batman stream seemed to have been quite successful, so uh, I, I I I had my doubts, but um, uh, they they did seem to have got the ones that have been mm. and gone seem to have done well. But for some reason. AA has chosen not to do the final one, and so Mr. Hat and myself jumped in, and we thought we'd talk about a poem. Uh, you did the wonderful stream with AA talking about Andrew Marvell. Yes. Um, and I would, I would like to, uh, I would like to add, by the way, we're still doing the make the Marvell stream over time the most profitable stream. So keep sending super chats and say that they're for the Marvell stream because this is still happening. We're going to do it. It's going to be the it's going to be the, gr- the gross highest stream uh, on the, the uh, on biggest ho- stream ever on YouTube. Yeah, yeah. there you go. Um, and so, of course, we've wanted to do. I mean, we, M- Mr. D and I talk uh, very regularly um, outside of uh, being on live streams, and uh, T. S. Eliot and the Wasteland and lots of other pieces of poems and, and art as well are part of our passion. Um, um, I myself am a poet, a published poet. Uh, I, 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 it's my main passion in life. Um, and uh, we, we've talked about T.S. Eliot and the Wasteland on many other occasions, but because we knew we were doing this today and it was on such short notice, um, we, we stayed up all night, all night, running through the poem line by line, making sure we understood it as completely as we could, pronouncing everything correctly, knowing the meat because of course this is a i mean if you heard of this poem at all you probably know it's it's a little daunting um is the reputation it has just to to to, 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 to say the least um yeah it's, so we, it, it's, it's, it's we yes and so we did we certainly did us chair reviewing i actually have a long history with elliot i've i've loved poetry i mean f- famously my first the first book i can remember reading uh being given by my parents was Edmund Spencer's The Fairy Queen, mm-hmm. um, which if you've ever tried to read The Fairy Queen, that's also a, quite a daunting work. But I, I have yeah. a long a long love and admiration uh, uh, of, of poetry. In fact, I'm not a, terrible, uh, a terribly big fan of fiction. I tend to prefer verse and poetry over, uh, over the novel and fiction. Um, and I remember reading The Wasteland when I was probably about 14 13 14 mm-hmm. um you know and I, I actually was you know became so interested in it that in university i for one reason or the other i uh, wrote about elliot in the wasteland and i memorized the poem and i used to be able to recite it i i sadly have lost most of my faculties so i can't do that anymore but uh, hopefully i i'm still uh, um, proficient enough that uh, we can do it justice today. <clears throat> yes, um, I first came across. Well, actually, I, I should say, of course, you told me um, that, of course, you actually downloaded an audio file of T. S. Eliot himself reading this poem before I was born. 
Um, that's how <laughs> far back Mr. D goes with this. Yeah, it's actually while, whilst I was in yeah. university, I mean, people have to remember that, that back then, you know, the internet was um, was a very sort of new phenomenon. And, um, you know, before the internet, when you were reading The Wasteland, you know, it, it was difficult because if you wanted to know what, what Elliot was talking about, what, what some line referred to, you you had to f- you you had to find it in a book if you had the book mm. uh, you had to figure out what book you would look in and so it wasn't easy uh, to kind of do an exegesis of a poem like this um, and most difficult for me was of course figuring out how to pronounce certain things in the poem and so I remember on the very early internet using university access I found audio files of. Uh, uh, of Eliot reading the poem. I believe they were recorded in the 1950s, um, although I'm not entirely sure about that. But yeah, um, a man who we looked into called Carl Malamud uh, <laughs> had, an orga- had an organization in the very early days of the internet in which they uploaded, um, you know, lots of kind of cultural things, including files, of uh, uh, sound recordings of poets reading their poetry. It took bloody ages to download mm. i mean they're like three megabytes each but back then that was, that was fairly significant um uh thing so yeah, yeah i mean 19, I, I do have a 1996 1996 i think yeah. is when i downloaded them <laughs> i still have the files i mean we, we were laughing about the fact that i that i in about 2003 i had copied all of my files off the of floppy disks yeah. and lurking on one hard drive after another are all these files, including these four files of Elliot reading the Wasteland. So, yeah. Mm. Um, not to mention, actually, I, I collect books, and I I have uh, a first American edition of Poems 1909-1925 right next to me with Elliot's signature uh, on the title page. So I have, a, I have my signed edition uh, doing a little bragging of Elliot uh, to keep me company. Yes. Um, and I think, of course, uh, we should probably... Give some notes on T.S. Eliot, shouldn't we? Yes, yeah, so let's um, talk about Eliot. You, you can uh, you fill our view. I mean, I think people will be familiar with his name, at least. People, but, will, um, have, people will have heard the name, yes, yeah. I think, certainly. Um, I mean, T.S. Eliot was... He did quite a lot in his life. Um, okay, so, I mean, I'll, I'll begin by saying that he lived from... He, he was... he li- Miss, Mr. D and I have an interest in people who lived a particular lifespan from the kind of Victorian era all the way into recent memory. Um, so, I mean, Thomas Stearns Eliot, as he was, uh, was born in 1888, and he lived until 1965. Um, I mean, that is quite a lifetime, isn't it? Sort of straddling the the end of the, of the 1800s and all the way into the 60s. Um, yeah. I mean, keep in mind, yeah. Eliot died 10 years before I was born. I mean, yeah. you know, <laughs> to, to sort of a bit terrifying. Um, I think it's also of note that Eliot was an American. I, yeah. I think a lot of people don't know it. that. Mm. He, he, uh, he was very, he was very adept at hiding that. Uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> shame of his birth. Um, uh, but he was born in St. St. Louis, Missouri, uh, and um, his family were quite prominent people uh, yeah. who Boston had their roots Brahmin. in Boston Brahmin. Yes, yeah. very so upper he, class. Yeah, so he was an upper class um, sort of uh, yeah. American, and, and did have uh, did have sort of Anglo, deep Anglo ties, but he was technically an American. Uh, uh, of course, Ezra Pound, who we will talk about in conjunction with this poem, was also an American. Yes, um, um, though of course it's interesting because because Eliot consciously made himself into a kind of almost caricature of the English gentleman. Um, and he, he, you wouldn't think listening to him or looking at him that he was American. Whereas e- Ezra Pound never gave up his kind of flamboyant Americanness. You know, he even he even used to write notes in kind of American slang. He used to talk about the worst thing about being in an insane asylum is that you cannot get to the publishers and keep a gun on them. You know? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, yes. Um, uh, Lumberg brings up an interesting point. I, I'm sort of thinking, what would people's most familiar oh. uh, point of reference with Eliot be? And, yeah. and Lumberg mentions Old Possum's book of Practical Cats, which oh, yes. Eliot published uh, under a pseudonym originally. Mm. Uh, it, it was meant as a book, I believe, written for family members. It, it yes, wasn't it was... really a, 
so Elliot, um, I believe it was a niece he had, a young mm. niece or or some some young relatives. And he had this habit where he would send them letters and Uncle Uncle Tom, as he would have been, would write po like funny poems for the kids um in, in, in his letters. And um because I think it was one of the nieces was obsessed with cats. She loved cats and kind of stories about cats. So he started writing uh, a recurring series of, of funny poems where the cats um, all have these kind of characters and, and names. And they're, they're, there's a kind of law. He created this kind of mythos around these cats. And eventually, he decided, as you said, he compiled these um, rather funny, um, quite, quite funny little poems. Uh, very, 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 very kind of um, very kind of humorous and, and, and witty into a small collection. He published it under a pseudonym. However, you may not think you've heard of this, but you definitely, definitely have, because not very long after, um, a certain um, Lord uh, Andrew Lloyd Webber um, happened to come along um, sometime in the 80s, I believe. And... Yeah, 1981, I believe it was. Yeah. Yes, and what he did... Now, he didn't intend really for this to become what it did he was an admirer of old possum's book of practical cats and he thought that the kind of the, the, the lyrics were funny so he set them to music um remember this he didn't he didn't add he didn't like build this up into a musical there were there was no story really other than what's in the poems there's no um kind of grandness to it he just wanted to make a small sort of music and dance n number out of these so song lyrics and then, of course, it became an enormous international uh, hit and is still being performed all over the world to this day. There is probably several groups of people performing Cats as we speak. Um, of course, yeah, Cats yeah. was what it became. I mean, um, I've seen the show. I mean, I'm not terribly fond of Andrew Lloyd Webber's music, but I've seen the show. Um, I saw I, I saw the not the original production, but I, I saw it uh, in New York in the late 80s, I think. And I saw it in London as well. So, uh, but yes, I mean, that that would be people's entry point. I was also wrong. Uh, uh, Old Possum's Book of Practical Cats was published by Faber and Faber under Elliot's name. Under Elliot, okay. So, um, but uh, Old Possum actually was was uh, Ezra Pound's nickname for Elliot. So yes. I would, uh, Elliot, I, I should say, Elliot, in personality-wise, was... I mean, I want to use the word dull. Not, not dull as in dull in the mind he was just very straight laced um yeah. he was very he was a very quiet intellectual man um always wore like a black suit with an umbrella and a bowler hat and all the all all, all the staff at um F faber and faber which is the publishing company that he took over and then made into a, a success um called him the old rolled umbrella when they saw him coming up the street because he you know he he was so he was so kind of uh you know uh, quintessential in his kind of way as a sort of as, as a as a as a want to be Englishman, you might say. Um, yes, and um, you know, and, uh, and obviously that I mean, it, it, we we mentioned the you know old possum's book of practical cats, but of course, um, I think Elliot is also very well known for the love song of J. Alfred Prufrock. Yeah, um, another poem, you know, which which people will be familiar. The Hollow Men. Mm -hmm. uh, which again, um, this is the way the world ends. I mean, people will be familiar with some of these lines. Elliot yes. had a very, um, I would say, a very distinctive poetical voice or poetical style that people may may have heard, you know. And it, mm. it, once you sort of get these little um, Elliot uh, Elliot phrases and Elliot sort of lines, you know, it's they're quite um, unmistakable, I would say. Yes. Um, yes, and he, he, um, so I mean, so yes, as, as, as we mentioned, we gave some details of his life. He was born to a very, very prominent upper class New England family that moved to Missouri. Um, he went off to Smith Academy, um, and then he went off to Harvard, um, and he was, he was very academic. He 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 was he was very obsessed with literature and philosophy. Um, he did his bachelor's, he did a master's, and then he kind of went off on this tour of Europe. Um, 
and he, he was also he had a great flair for languages um of course being of the upper class at that time he learned latin and greek fluently probably by the time he was in his early teens um he learned german he learned french he also learned a bunch of eastern languages he learned sanskrit um and various other indian uh or or, or sort of languages uh from that from that uh, part of the world uh, that have that have written texts, um, and um, then in 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 1914 he showed up in Merton College, Oxford, um, and kind of that was really where he sort of ossified almost. Um, he he kind of fell in love with um, the kind of British way, I suppose, especially the kind of the the the, the university life. Although he didn't much like being in Oxford, he didn't really like being around students and sort of university types he much preferred being out in the country and very often the only reason he would he would hang around was because he met Ezra Pound there um who was also in in London and in Oxford at the time um and they they became friends and e I mean Ezra Pound was somewhat more established at that time and he basically helped um uh T.S. Eliot to become a poet at all he got he got T.S. Eliot's early work uh in print um and then of course the war took place obviously neither pound nor elliot had to go because they were americans um and then uh he stayed in uh england from then on as far as i'm aware uh, he married a woman called vivienne haig wood um and he himself said that he basically married her because he felt desperate to be able to stay in 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 the country and uh, of course marrying someone is is a simple or a comparatively simple way to do that and um he unfortunately um things kind of went downhill for him uh from there because he he began to suffer from lack of money and poor personal health he got a job in uh, lloyd's bank um to make ends meet which uh earned comparatively little and he hated it it was he was working there all day and he hated it had no, had no time to write and his wife basically went potty i mean she she succumbed to severe mental health issue, issues um she'd be locked up in, in in an asylum for much of what was left of her life um and she was also very ill and this period um this is coming up to 1920 um caused him to have um caused him to have a mental breakdown um and of all places to recover, he ended up in Margate, which, as you'll see, is mentioned in this poem. Um, and then he went off to Switzerland. And that was the state of mind out of which the wasteland came. Now, again, we discussed this last night and we were very we decided the two of us that pinning um, pinning kind of personal trivia to works of art is is uh, haram in our book. Well, it's, um, it's risky because I think yeah. there's a there's a modern um, tendency to attribute everything to biography. Yes. I mean, this I think this is part of the larger kind of twentieth um, century cult cultural trend of of, of psychoanalytics, which it's is very female. Yes, which everything becomes a kind of part of a of the grand psychodrama of a person's life. And yes, I mean, obviously, biography is an important part. And, mm -hmm. and personal experiences an important part of the work of an artist. But I think that people tend to go overboard with trying to attribute everything that an artist does to um, not to rational choice and inspiration, but to the kind of detritus of, of their life. And uh, so I, I tend to avoid that. But I do think it's very important. And, and certainly Eliot's, uh, I would say, unusual circumstances uh, played a certainly played a part in um in this and and there were very specific references i believe one of which was removed on the insistence of vivian uh to their marriage um, yes in in the way in the wasteland so and um, um he he actually um it was it was so kind of again you'll 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 see what we mean but the, some of the imagery and the tone of the poem is so apocalyptically gloomy um, Eliot himself actually um, wrote a statement before it was uh, printed, saying that he somewhat distanced himself from the, from what he'd written, basically, um, because he was in an extremely dark place when he did so. And this isn't to say that there's anything false or that he didn't think in the poem, but you know, um, 
for someone like Elliot, who who really was actually a very humorous man, who had a great flair for um, joy. I mean, you know, as as many people will probably know, he later became a Christian um, and kind of and kind of had a far more um, metaphysically optimistic view than you might think from this poem. Um, you know, this is really quite a, a hard hitting look at the modern world that had come out of the First World War. Um, yes, and and, and and should keep in mind, of course, this poem is so famous and is so famously associated with Eliot. But of course, Eliot didn't didn't consider the Wasteland his masterpiece. No, uh, he considered the Four Quartets his masterpiece, which I agree. I mean, I yes. think out of Eliot's entire canon, uh, those the Four Quartets are uh, a, a, a font of extraordinary power. Um, and yes. perhaps in the future we can we can deal with those. Well, but that that is a tall order. Um, I mean, just but, to sorry, go on. Uh, yes, but I, I just yes, and I, I think Hat mentioned Eliot's conversion. Um, he he was brought up a unita strict Unitarian, and, and and this would have been Unitarianism prior to the kind of merging of Unitarian Universalism. I mean, there is an, a current Unitarian Church, but it's a very different entity than the the late nineteenth century institution in America that you know that Elliot and his family were part of. Uh, but in the twenties, I believe, in uh, the same year that Elliot became a British citizen, he converted to the Anglican Church. But he always considered himself an Anglo Catholic rather yeah. than than a, than, a, than an Anglican. Uh, in fact, I, I believe the the line was uh, a, a, a Catholic in the mind, a Calvinist heritage and a puritanical temperament. Um, so, uh, yes, something like yes, that. Yes, yeah. So, um, yeah. So his faith certainly became very important to his work, and and I think the the wasteland probably represents a period before this, a sort of period where he was struggling with ideas of his faith and understandings and relationships with God. Uh, yeah, which became much more central to his life later on. There was there was a feeling, I think, that the world had basically left him nothing, um, as it had left most people nothing. It seemed yeah. um, by that point. Um, what was I going to say? Um, yes, I was. Well, ju just to illustrate, I mean, M Mr. D made the point that um, really the four quartets are Eliot's masterpiece, which I agree with wholeheartedly. But ju just to illustrate here. I mean, we're talking about one of the greatest um, talents ever displayed in the last few hundred years of English English verse. I mean, from the standpoint of from from a from a, a, tr a kind of professional standpoint, when it comes to the, com the composition of the poem, the intelligence and the adeptness and the musicality and the way he weaves. Um, hints and foreshadowing before he does something in the poem are incredible. I mean, it's it's like it's like you know it's like listening to Bach almost when you when you listen to music. You're you're just you're just swept away by the um, the the intricacy and the kind of beauty um, that that have that have gone into this. I mean, um, as we said, he was in an awful place uh, in his life when he. Um, I mean, quite literally as well. He was in Margate, um, but uh, an awful place when he, when he composed this. But it uh, doesn't mean that he kind of dashed it off uh, without any thought. Clearly, this is an extremely um, well worked over, very highly f uh, finished piece of piece of craftsmanship. Um, and I think it's also now important to mention that originally, um, and as, as you can see on the screen, it says for Ezra Pound there. Uh, originally, the draft that Eliot had of this poem was extremely different to what you see here. Um, it was about three or four times as long. The language and the tone were different. There was a lot more kind of um, neutralness of language and ambiguity of terms. It was a lot sort of more, honestly, it was a lot sort of more rambling um and he gave this draft to Ezra Pound who cut through it with a scythe i mean he he trimmed this poem down as i said to about a third of its original length he made he made a huge amount of edits to it he basically took uh he took what he saw as a as a diamond in the rough and cut it into a fine 
a fine piece, basically. Um, yeah. Um, yeah, Pand, Pand, and, and uh, Pand actually considered, he wrote a poem to sort of celebrate the publication uh, of The Wasteland, in which mm. he compared him, compared Eliot to the, as a mother pregnant with the poem and, and himself, Pound as the midwife delivering yes. it. Um, it's a very accurate comparison, I think. Yes. Um, but but uh, we'll, we'll talk more about specifically this, this these aspects of the poem. Um, I don't really want to talk too much about the poem itself before we have no. it, before we read it. Um, do, do we want to mention um, do, do you think we should just ver very briefly mention modernism in relation to this poem or, or the uh, I, because i think the form of this poem is probably quite challenging for people who yes. are used to classical verse you know yes um i um so yes the modernism of this poem um is a bit of a slap in the face when you first read it indeed um, it provoked confusion and hostility from many critics, um, including one Gilbert Keith Chesterton and one Howard Phillips Lovecraft, um, who both repudiated this. In fact, uh, Lovecraft wrote a satirical version of the poem called The Waste Paper, uh, a poem of profound insignificance. Um, um, because he said, I mean... Be, be simply because I think that 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 it's easy now in all these years of hindsight and with all the critical acclaim that this poem now has to see it for the masterpiece it is. When something comes at you fresh, you you simply don't. I mean, you know, most great pieces of art, I think, I'm c confident in saying most, get ignored or they get trashed by critics when they when they appear. I mean, like. The whole point of a lot of genius is that it isn't recognized when it happens, you know. Um, you know, for example, I, I was reading about Keats uh, yesterday, who who every everything he ever published in his in his brief life was so trashed by critics it makes you cry when you read the reviews. I mean, it really just savaged to death. Um, and then, of course, you know, they ended up becoming some of the most acclaimed well-loved verse in the English canon, uh, full stop. Um, and I mean, this poem suffers from that, I think mainly because of the the, the use of, of modernism. Now, there is rhyme in the poem, and there is metricality, and there is musicality, and this is not simply a jumble of words. This is a very carefully chosen um, piece of, of, of poetry. Each, each letter was cr was put in its place with much thought we 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 know this um you know just because it sometimes seems like all these words are just flowing and they, they don't seem to grasp anything that isn't the case remember a lot of you may be hearing this for the for the first time as well um you know all i can say to you is just hold on <laughs> don't 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 dismiss it straight, straight away because there is really a huge amount of depth to this to admire. And I say this as a traditionalist in poetry. I say this as somebody that, that tends to write traditionally metrical uh, rhymed verse and has, and has published my, my career in poetry so far has largely been staked on that. Um, but I, I am not an opponent of modernism as such. I'm, I'm an opponent of bad poetry and to say that just because you don't use strict uh, romantic forms of metricality and, and rhyme and meter um, is like saying that uh, a painting is bad because it doesn't use the color green. You know, it's it's simply it's one way of writing a poem. It's one way of composing a poem and 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 communicating what you're trying to get across with that poem. Um, yeah, and I, this so, is a struggle I encounter all the time. I mean, I I, I will frequently complain about my efforts to sort of get people to have a broader understanding of what communication and um, w w is in, 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 in the visual arts. Uh, and, and certainly modernism in painting um, had a, a relationship, certainly to modernism in poetry, modernism in literature. And it is something mm. that, that we can talk about um, uh, late, later on. Um, let, is there anything else we want to say about Eliot uh, in, in a biographical sense? I, I also, I, I don't know if you mentioned it, but Eliot um, 
he ended up being a director of Faber and Faber, I think. Um, yes. <clears throat> and, and he was responsible for, I think, getting people like um, uh, Auden uh, mm -hmm, published. That's right. And, and a Ted Hughes. All, uh, all through his life, yeah. Ted Hughes, Auden, um, a great deal of others I could uh, name. Let me think. Uh, John Betjeman. Um, mm. who I who I believe had actually been taught by Elliot um, when Elliot had a teaching position. Yes, um, right after he arrived, Elliot took a job teaching at a at a private school somewhere near Oxford, and one of his pupils was John Benjamin, um, yeah. and he would later go on to help him get published. Um, yeah. Yes. Um, so, yeah, I, I think we I. Before I get fatigued, I think we should read the poem. Um, yeah. <clears throat> so uh, we're going to sort of take it in turns uh, reading this. It's, it's going to probably take us about a half an hour, 20, 20, 25 minutes, half an hour to read this. So everyone should so certainly settle in. Um, it, it may help people to follow along. Uh, hopefully we'll have the text of the poem scrolling. Uh, or if you're, you know, if you're at at a computer, obviously, if you're listening to this, mm -hmm. yeah. not on your phone, you should go to a website uh, with that has the poem. It's very easily found on the internet. Yeah, uh, AA, and, AA, I think it's going to scroll down um, yeah. as we read, so you'll be able to and, see it. If there's and fo good. follow along because, the, it, 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 as we said, this is this is challenging. Um, so we are going to do our very best uh, to give you a, a reading of the wasteland. Okay. Yes, we, we tried this last night. I can't promise it's going to be flawless, um, especially with my stuttering ways. Um, but uh, yes, we will we will we will do our best. We we have this is this is not a a cold read. We've we've been through this a number of times anyway. <clears throat> okay. So, uh, the wasteland by Don the Pleb. Uh. <laughs> All, right. All right. The wasteland. Nam sibilam kidem humis ego ipse oculis meis widi in ampula pendere et cum ili pueri disarent. Sibula, ti thelit. Respondebiat ila apo fani thelo. For Ezra Pan, il milio fabro. The Burial of the Dead. April is the cruelest month, breeding lilacs out of the dead land, mixing memory and desire, stirring dull roots with spring rain. Winter kept us warm, covering earth in forgetful snow, feeding a little life with dried tubers. Summer surprised us, coming over the Starnberger say, with a shower of rain, we stopped in the colonnade and went on in sunlight into the Hofgarten and drank coffee and talked for an hour. Bin gar keine Russen, stamm aus Litauen, ek Deutsch. And when we were children, staying at the Archduke's, my cousin, he took me out on a sled, and I was frightened. He said, Marie, Marie, hold on tight, and down we went. In the mountains, there you feel free. I read much of the night and go south in the winter. What are the roots that clutch? What branches grow out of this stony rubbish? Son of man, you cannot say or guess, for you know only a heap of broken images where the sun beats and the dead tree gives no shelter, the cricket no relief and the dry stone, no sign of water. Only there is shadow under this red rock. Come in under the shadow of this red rock, and I will show you something different from either your shadow at morning striding behind you or your shadow at evening rising to meet you. I will show you fear in a handful of dust. Frisch wet der Wind Der Heimat zu, mein irisch Kind, wo weilest du? You gave me hyacinths first a year ago. They called me the hyacinth girl. Yet, when we came back late, 
in the hyacinth garden. Your arms were full and your hair wet. I could not speak. And my eyes failed. I was neither living nor dead. And I knew nothing. Looking into the heart of light. The silence. Ert und leer das Meer. Madame Sosostris, famous clairvoyant, had a bad cold. Nevertheless, is known to be the wisest woman in Europe with a wicked pack of cards. Here, said she, is your card, the drowned Phoenician sailor. Those are pearls that were his eyes. Look. Here is Belladonna, lady of the rocks, the lady of situations. Here is the man with three staves, and here the wheel. And here is the one-eyed merchant. And this card, which is blank, is something he carries on his back, which I am forbidden to see. I do not find the hanged man. Fear death by water. I see crowds of people walking round in a ring. Thank you. If you see dear Mrs. Equitone, tell her I bring the horoscope myself. One must be so careful these days. Unreal city, under the brown fog of a winter dawn, a crowd flowed over London Bridge, so many. I had not thought death had undone so many. Sighs, short and infrequent, were exhaled, and each man fixed his eyes before his feet, flowed up the hill and down King William Street, to where St. Mary Woolnoth kept the hours with a dead sound on the final stroke of nine. There I saw one I knew and stopped him, crying, Stetson, you who were with me in the ships at Miley, that corpse you planted last year in your garden, has it begun to sprout? Will it bloom this year? Or has the sudden frost disturbed its bed? Oh, keep the dog far hence, that's friend to men, or with his nails he'll dig it up again. You, hypocrite lecteur, mon semblable, mon frère. A Game of Chess The chair she sat in, like a burnished throne, glowed on the marble, where the glass held up by standards wrought with fruited vines from which a golden cupidon peeped out. Another hid his eyes behind his wing, doubled the flames of the seven-branched candelabra, reflecting light upon the table as the glitter of her jewels rose to meet it. From satin cases poured in rich profusion, in vials of ivory and coloured glass, unstoppered, lurked her strange synthetic perfumes. Unguent, powdered or liquid, troubled, confused and drowned the scents in odours, stirred by the air that freshened from the window. These ascended and fattening the prolonged candle flames, flung their smoke into the laquaria, stirring the pattern on the coffered ceiling. Huge sea wood fed with copper burned green and orange, framed by the coloured stone in which the sad light a carved dolphin swam. Above the antique mantle was displayed as though a window gave upon the sylvan scene the change of Philomel by the barbarous king, so rudely forced, yet there the nightingale filled all the desert with inviolable voice, and still she cried, and still the word pursues jug-jug to dirty ears, and other withered stumps of time were told upon the walls, staring forms leaned out, leaning, hushing the room enclosed, footsteps shuffled on the stair, under the firelight, under the brush, her hair spread out in fiery points, glowed into words, then would be savagely still. My nerves are, are bad tonight. Uh, yes, bad. S stay with me. Speak to me. Why do you never speak? Speak. What are you thinking of? What thinking what? I never know what you're thinking. Think. I think we are in Rat Sally, where the dead men lost their bones. What is that noise? The wind under the door. What's that noise now? What's the wind doing? Nothing again, nothing. Do you know nothing? Do you see nothing? Do you remember nothing? I remember. Those are pearls that were his eyes. Are you, are you alive or not? Is there nothing in your head? But, oh, 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 that Shakespearean rag, it's so elegant. 
so intelligent. What shall I do now? What shall I do? Uh, I shall rush out as I am and walk the street with my hair down. So, what shall we do tomorrow? What shall we ever do? The hot water at ten, and if it rains, a closed car at four. And we shall play a game of chess, pressing lidless eyes and waiting for a knock upon the door. When Lil's husband got demobbed, I said, I didn't mince me words. I said to myself, hurry up, please. It's time. Now, Albert's coming back. Make yourself a bit smart. He'll want to know what you've done with that money he gave you to get yourself some tea. If he did, I was there. You have them all out, Lil, and get a nice set, he said. I swear I can't bear to look at you, and no more can't I, I said. And think of poor Albert. He's been in the army four years. He wants a good time. And if you don't give it him, there's others will, I said. Oh, there is, she said. Something of like that, I said. Then I'll owe you the thanks, she said, and give me a straight look. Hurry up, please. It's time. If you don't like it, you can get on with it, I said. Others can pick and choose if you can't. But if Albert makes off, it won't be for lack of telling. You ought to be ashamed, I said, to look so antique and er, only 31. I can't help it, she said, pulling a long face. It's them pills I took to bring it off, she said. She's had five already and nearly died a young George. The chemist said it would be all right, but I've never been the same. You are a proper fool, I said. Well, if Albert won't leave you alone, there it is, I said. What'd you get married for if you don't want children? Hurry up, please. It's time. Well, that Sunday, Albert was home, and they had an hot gammon, and they asked me at the dinner to get the beauty of it hot. Hurry up, please. It's time. Hurry Good up, night, please. Bill. It's time. Good night, Bill. Good night, Lou. Good night, May. Good night. Ta-ta. Good night. Good night. Good night, ladies. Good night, sweet ladies. Good night. Good night. The Fire Sermon The river's tent is broken. The last fingers of leaf clutch and sink into the wet bank. The wind crosses the brown land unheard. The nymphs are departed. Sweet Thames runs softly till I end my song. The river bears no empty bottles, sandwich papers, silk handkerchiefs, cardboard boxes, cigarette ends, or other testimony of summer nights. The nymphs are departed, and their friends, the loitering heirs of city directors departed, have left no addresses. By the waters of Lehman, I sat down and wept. Sweet Thames, run softly till I end my song. Sweet Thames, run softly, for I speak not loud or long. But at my back in a cold blast I hear the rattle of bones and chuckle spread from ear to ear. A rat crept softly through the vegetation, dragging its slimy belly on the bank while I was fishing in the dull canal on a winter evening round behind the gas house, musing upon the king my brother's wreck and on the king my father's death before him. White bodies naked on the low damp ground and bones cast in a little low dry garret, rattled by the rat's foot only, year to year. But at my back from time to time I hear the sound of hordes and motors which shall bring Sweetie to Mrs. Porter in the spring. Oh, the moon shone bright on Mrs. Porter and on her daughter. They washed their feet in soda water. Et au savoir d'enfants chantant dans la coupole. Twit, 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 jug, jug, jug. Jug, 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 so rudely forced. Tiro. Unreal city, under the brown fog of a winter moon, Mr. Eugenides, the Smyrna merchant, unshaven, with a pocket full of currants, CIF London, documents at sight, asked me in demotic French to luncheon at the Cannon Street Hotel, followed by a weekend at the Metropole. At the violet hour, when the eyes and back turn upward from the desk, when the human engine waits like a taxi throbbing waiting. I, Tiresias, though blind, throbbing between two lives, old man with wrinkled female breasts, can see at the violet hour, the evening hour, that strives homeward and brings the sailor home from sea. The typist home at tea time clears her breakfast, lights her stove, and lays out food in tins. Out of the window perilously spread her drying combinations, touched by the sun's last rays. On the divan are piled at night her bed, stockings, slippers, camisoles, and stays. I, Tiresias, old man with wrinkled dugs, perceived the scene and foretold the rest. I, too, awaited the expected guest. 
He, the young man called Bunk Killer, arrives, a small house agent's clerk, with one bold stare, one of the low on whom assurance sits as a silk hat on a Bradford millionaire. The time is now propitious, as he guesses. The meal is ended. She is bored and tired, endeavors to engage her in caresses, which are unreproved, if undesired. Flushed and decided, he assaults at once, Exploring hands encounter no defense. His vanity requires no response and makes a welcome of indifference. And I, Tiresias, have foresuffered all enacted on this same divan or bed. I who have sat by Thebes below the wall and walked among the lowest of the dead. Bestows one final patronizing kiss and gropes his way, finding the stairs unlit. She turns and looks a moment in the glass, hardly aware of her departed lover. Her brain allows one half-formed thought to pass. Well, now that's done, and I'm glad it's over. When lovely woman stoops to folly and paces about her room again alone, she soothes her hair with automatic hand and puts a record on the gramophone. This music crept by me upon the waters and along the strand. Up Queen Victoria Street, oh, city, city, I can sometimes hear beside a public bar in Lower Thames Street the pleasant whining of a mandoline and a clatter and a chatter from within, where fishermen lounge at noon, where the walls of Magnus Martyr hold inexplicable splendor of Ionian white and gold. The river sweats, oil and tar, the barges drift with the turning tide, red sails wide to leeward, swing on the heavy spar. The barges wash, drifting logs down Greenwich Reach past the Isle of Dogs. Way a la la, lay a wa la la la, lay a la la. Elizabeth and Lester beating oars, the stern was formed, a gilded shell, red and gold. The brisk swell rippled both shores, southwest wind carried downstream with the peal of bells, white towers. Way a la la lea, wa la la lea la la. Trams and dusty trees, Highbury bore me. Richmond and Kew undid me. By Richmond I raised my knees supine on the floor of a narrow canoe. My feet are at Moorgate, and my heart under my feet. After the event, he wept. He promised a new start. I made no comment. What should I resent? On Margate Sands, I can connect nothing with nothing. The broken fingernails and dirty hands. My people humble people who expect nothing. La la, to Carthage then I came, burning, 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 burning. O oh Lord, thou pluckest me out. O oh Lord, thou pluckest burning. Death by water. Phlebas, the Phoenician, a fortnight dead, Forgot the cry of gulls, and the deep sea swell, and the profit and loss. A current under sea picked his bones in whispers. As he rose and fell, he passed the stages of his age and youth, entering the whirlpool, Gentile or Jew. O oh, you who turn the wheel and look to windward, consider Phlebas, who was once handsome and tall as you. What the thunder said. After the torchlight, red on sweaty faces, after the frosty silence in the gardens, after the agony in stony places, the shouting and the crying, prison and palace and reverberation of thunder of spring over distant mountains. He who was living is now dead. We who were living are now dying with a little patience. Here is no water, but only rock, rock and no water, and the sandy road, the road winding above among the mountains, which are mountains of rock without water. If there were water, we should stop and drink. Amongst the rock, one cannot stop or think. Sweat is dry, and feet are in the sand. If there were only water amongst the rock, dead mountain mouth of carious teeth, that cannot spit. Here one can neither lie, nor stand, nor sit. There is not even silence in the mountains, but dry, sterile thunder without rain. There is not even solitude in the mountains, but red, sullen faces sneer and snarl from doors of mud-cracked houses. If there were water, 
and no rock if there were rock and also water and water, a spring, a pool among the rock. If there were the sound of water only, not the cicada and dry grass singing, but sound of water over a rock where the hermit thrush sings in the pine trees, drip, drop, drip, drop, drop, drop. But there is no water. Who is the third who walks always beside you? When I can, there are only you and I together. But when I look ahead up the white road, there is always another one walking beside you, gliding, wrapped in a brown mantle, hooded. I do not know whether a man or a woman. But who is that on the other side of you? What is that sound high in the air? Murmur of maternal lamentation. Who are those hooded hordes swarming over endless plains, stumbling in cracked earth, ringed by the flat horizon only? What is the city over the mountains, cracks and reforms and bursts in the violet air? Falling towers, Jerusalem, Athens, Alexandria, Vienna, London. Unreal. A woman drew her long black hair out tight and fiddled whisper music on those strings, and bats with baby faces in the violet light whistled and beat their wings and crawled head downward down a blackened wall, and upside down in air were towers tolling reminiscent bells that kept the hours and voices singing out of empty cisterns and exhausted wells. In this decayed hole among the mountains, in the faint moonlight, the grass is singing over the tumbled graves about the chapel. There is the empty chapel, only the wind's home. It has no windows, and the door swings. Dry bones can harm no one. Only a cock stood on the roof tree, Cocorico, Cocorico, in a flash of lightning. Then a damp gust, bringing rain. Ganga was sunken, and the limp leaves waited for rain, while the black clouds gathered far distant over him a vent. The jungle crouched, humped in silence. Then spoke the thunder, Da! Data, what have we given? My friend, blood shaking my heart, the awful daring of a moment's surrender, which an age of prudence can never retract. By this and this only we have existed, which is not to be found in our obituaries or in memories draped by the beneficent spider or under seals broken by the lean solicitor in our empty rooms. Da! Diadvam. I have heard the key turn in the door once and turn once only. We think of the key, each in his prison, thinking of the key, each confirms a prison. Only at nightfall ethereal rumours Revive for a moment a broken Coriolanus. Da! Damyaka. The boat responded gaily to the hand expert with sail and oar. The sea was calm. Your heart would have responded gaily when invited, beating obedient, controlling hands. I sat upon the shore fishing with the arid plain behind me, shall I at least set my lands in order? London Bridge is falling down, falling down, falling down. Quasi cosa nel foco che fina, quando fiam uti che don, oh swallow, swallow, le prince d'Equitaine à la tour aboli. These fragments I have shored against my ruins. Why then, I'll fit you. Hieronymo's mad again. Dr. Diadvam. 
Tamyaka Shanti 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 And there you have it. <clears throat> <clears throat> there we go. Oh, wasteland. Yes. Um, <laughs> wasteland. So that is the wasteland. And um, hopefully um, uh, people were, uh, were following along. Um, chat, chat seems very enthusiastic, actually. I was surprised. Yes. But again, I mean, I think that obviously there's there's a number of people scratching their heads, but people... People always think that this that poetry, especially this sort of uh, this modern poetry, has to be so dreary and dull. But they don't realize how fun it is to read it and to, oh, yeah. <laughs> to act yeah, it out. Absolutely. I mean, it's great fun. Great no, it's fun wonderful. And this is a yeah, it's a this is a wonderful poem uh, to read because it's um, I mean, it's really, you know, that there. Are, I mean, as we'll talk about, it, there's a profusion of voices. I mean, there are characters, yes. there are situations, there are. Um, you know, sort of tones and emotions, and it's all over the place. I mean, it really encompasses so many aspects of, you know, kind of human character and human interaction. Um, so, yes, it, it's it's great fun to read. But, but again, a challenge. And I, I do think it helps to hear it read. Um, I mean, reading it, you know, is certainly an, an experience and, and a good experience. But I, I do think that, uh, as with so much poetry, I mean, people, I think people forget that poetry is in a way inextricably linked to song, you know, and, and to music and to the oral tradition. So I do think that that recitation is is and 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 the experience of hearing a poem is um is very important. Mm. Yes, I mean people I think of course this is this is quite a big uh uh an, an argument over the course of the history of, 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 of poetry and among poets is is poetry fundamentally uh, a spoken art or a written art, and I think that there there are very compelling. I mean, I think the the answer is that it's 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 a bit of both, you know. But really, in order for it to be considered a poem or at least a good poem for me, it has to have musicality. It has to have a pleasant ring to the ear, mm. um, appropriately. You know, that's what's so wonderful about a poet like Dylan Thomas, for example. He wrote his poems almost exclusively to be pleasurable to the ear, you know, more than anything else. Um, yeah. I mean, that is really at the, at, at the heart of the matter. And I think that's very true of, 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 of this poem, the, 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 the Wasteland. It's, it's, it's the, 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 ta the, the basic talent of poetry in the same way that a visual artist has to be able to draw, to, to, in, in the basic sense, to draw accurately. You have to be able to, to compose language in a way that that is that is that is pleasurable you know to, to, to the ear you have to be able to have that instinctive ability to to make poetry to make poetry from words um and yeah, that's, I, all, that's what's happening all through this <clears throat> in, indeed and i think there's also very i mean a, a very intimate um uh, analogy you can make with with painting i mean if you take the idea of you know uh a, a representational painting, you know, of a scene. I mean, yes, you know, if it's depicting a landscape, you you see the sky, you see trees, you see grass, you see all of those things. But what you're also seeing is a hundred, a thousand, a ten thousand, a hundred thousand decisions by an artist with a mind and an eye and a heart and a hand. Yeah. Um, who has chosen every stroke? Who has put his Brush. Never as easy as it looks, is it? <laughs> to put his brush to every inch of the canvas, and again, it it is a sky and it is a tree and it is whatever, but it's also a collection of paint. It's a it's a relationship of colors. It's a relationship of lines, and very much the same with poems. I mean, you're you're conveying a meaning, but you're also just giving people sounds. You're giving people words. You're you're uh, you're firing. Uh, you know, you, you're causing little um synapses to fire in people's brains and to make connections you know i think the one thing that poetry does that prose you know that that, that prose lacks a bit it's is this is suggestive yes mm. it, it it allows you to make some of these jumps it allows you to make these sort of fanciful um relationships between words and between yes. ideas and uh yeah 
that's that's why this is poetry not prose i mean the example that i always always use when it comes to what makes language poetic is if i said to you right sit sit down and in prose in pure just just descriptive prose write about the dawn it's going to be so dull isn't it it's just going to be just endless just thousands and thousands and thousands of words trying to describe the dawn it isn't going to really mean anything at the end of the day because you can just look at the dawn you don't need a thousand words to, des to describe the dawn but when shakespeare says the dawn in russet mantle clad there in just a few words you have an entire picture painted in your head don't you you've got an entire yeah. sense of this dawn he's talking about and it doesn't even have to be a literal dawn you know that that's that's the that's the nexus of poetry that's that's the that's the genius of it that's that's the spark that makes it fly if you will is the the, the ability to, to do that to in a few choice words conjure up just infinite possibility and thoughts really that or at least yeah. in my opinion so um should we attack the wasteland just from the beginning uh, uh do you think that's the best way to, to go about it well uh, or do you think know. we should offer some kind of general summation well, of... well yes first i want to give a few general remarks about the poem and All right. what, what people just heard and then okay. i'd like to go through it and i would like to really go through it and i know that that aa always moans about streams being longer than like three hours or whatever but i personally i don't know about you and your, your time today but i'm willing to do as we did last night just go from top to bottom uh and kind of you know take people through the poem you know what these because there's because th th this poem a, a lot of you especially if you heard this for the first time will probably have you know thought you know what's this what's this what's this as each thing came along and elliot elliot knew this you you're not really meant to understand all the references here he's he's consciously filling the poem up with classical references um and not just classical, just just references to art, to literature, to poetry that have come uh, <clears throat> prior to him, um, and that that has a great significance to what the poem is is talking about. This idea of the the dead land, this land that is that is no longer um, it no longer produces anything. It's no longer fertile. You 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 heard Mister D reading towards the end there the, the lack of water. Everybody yearning for water. You know. Um, and I would say that as we discuss the aspects of this poem, keep in mind modernity. Keep in mind the modernity, not just that we live in, but that Eliot lived in a hundred hundred years ago. Um, because really, it's nothing has really changed. I mean, uh, superficially, it's different. But the things that he talks about when he's talking about what has what has happened and the the state of things as they are um, will ring true for many of you on symbolic and literal levels um yes <clears throat> um and just broadly um with regards to you know the modernism um i mean you you, you also must take into account when this poem like the period this poem came out of i mean this poem came from the shadow yeah. of world war ii and and also yeah but also the shadow of you know the victoria you know the end of the victorian era um the industrial revolution I mean, all the kind of social, societal and political um, and scientific changes that happened in that very, uh, very fast changing period. Uh, I would say that modernism was a sort of, um, you know, it was a sort of reaction against romanticism, which had come in the middle, later part of the 19th century. I mean, along with uh, other isms, you know, you, there's all sorts of like imagism and, and, and other other movements. But I would say broadly, romanticism was the um, the kind of direction of the late 19th century. And I think modernism came along and um, cast a a somewhat cynical eye on some of the ideas uh, present in mo uh, modernism, such as you know the sort of relationship with the sublime uh, and things like that. Uh, modernism saw the kind of um, fracturing of the idea of 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 the of the faithful coherence of language, you know, there there was a sense that, as with everything else that was starting to kind of crack and churn and turn, that that there was also, uh, you you couldn't have the faith in language, you couldn't have the faith in reason, you couldn't have the faith in anything as you were as you could before because of the nature 
of what was happening in the world. Mm. Um, so I think that, um, you know, this poem is sort of a, a great example of this, uh, the, uh, you know, the, sh the sort of shifting uh, of uh, coherent narrator, narrator the, sh uh, the sort of loss of a coherent chronology. I mean, this poem is all over the place. It skips around, it skips, you know, periods and eras and e eons. It skips yes. narrators, it skips points of views. And this is all kind of um, part and parcel of, of modernism and that modernity in poetry. So I just yes, wanted indeed. to sort of give give that as a foundation. Uh, and this would make it a very different, if we compare this to, this poem to, 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 to Wordsworth, another wonderful poet who was very much within the romantic tradition of the 19th century, um, you, you will see that there is a very different sort of understanding of what language is doing and what it's capable of. Yes, indeed. <clears throat> um, right, so, um, as uh, Dylan Thomas said, to begin at the beginning, um, <laughs> <laughs> under Milkwood. Um, yeah. Right. <clears throat> So, did so you, did you, you were going to make some sense before we start with the yeah. Um, I mean, we, we we kind of covered um, quite a lot uh, just then that I was going to yeah. say. I mean, okay. I mean, really, yes. And it's also worth pointing out that a lot of what we're going to draw from as we talk about this. Um, so, Eliot wrote a series of footnotes, um, <laughs> sort of academic style footnotes to the wasteland um, to quote explain many of the more difficult references in the poem. Um, and these, however, are not really straightforward references. These are really part of the poem um, because he writes them not cryptically as such, but he doesn't he doesn't simply sit there and explain why he, he did this and why he did that, because that would be that that would be anti art, wouldn't it? I mean, it's like you know, it's it's like once you've had somebody sit there and explain every facet of a painting to you, it, the, the the painter at the end of the facet to you. In in my opinion, you, you, you when you when you've done that, you've you've killed the painting. Um, you know, there there has to be a kind of um, uh, an ambiguousness about certain things, and there's much ambiguousness in this poem, obviously. Yeah. And um, yes, and so he's got. Uh, let me see here. He's got uh, 433 footnotes. Um, which, which, which tell you what, um, what the, <laughs> the various bits, bits and pieces mean. And there are also, there's external criticism. P people have, people have done lots of research on this poem. They've looked into things. The, we're, we're going to come across some remarkable bits of deep lore over the next, uh, yeah. hour or two. Um, you know, so, so, you know, get, get ready for that. You're going to, you're going mean, to, if there was ever a poem that needed a deep, deepest lore. I mean, this this is Wait, it, uh, yes. yeah. Uh, because because it is. I mean, uh, uh, it, it is. It's almost a puzzle, you know. And 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 within, you know, it's it's like there's nesting dolls, you know. Basically, within each shell is something else, you know. Mm. Is some is another object, and then within that, there's another object. Um, but I think there's also a remarkable coherence to what is what is being evoked what is being referenced um to the sort of ideas and images that, that Eliot I mean as you will hear I think that there is a very consistent focus on certain themes and certain yes. things um and uh now so obviously as, as you heard at the, at the beginning um Mr. D read an uh, an epigraph um, yeah. partly in Latin partly in Greek um, and I think you have the translation, don't you? You have the uh, yes. The... I mean, th this is a this is a bit from um, the Satyricon by um, Petronius, um, and the Satyricon is sort of a um, it's a kind of farce uh, that tells the tale of a uh, of an ex gladiator going on various adventures. I think it's mm -hmm. set in the something like the first century A.D. Uh, so, something like that. It's sort of um, the later, latter part of the, uh, you know, of the Roman Empire. Yes. Um, and the epigram, the epigraph of the wasteland, I think is really important. Uh, but of course, it's totally obscured because if you don't speak Latin or Greek, um, you know, Eliot doesn't translate it for you. You know, you, 
and and as with so many other things in the wasteland, you're not you're not getting your hand held. Um, but this particular bit from the Satyricon is um, references a Sibyl. So the Nam Siblam Kidem Kumis yes. uh, refers to the Sibyl, uh, 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 the, the Kumayan Sibyl, the Sibyl also, at Kumai. Also, uh, AA, if you're still there, would it be possible to have the poem back up on the screen? I, he, he, he may have left. Um, so <laughs> we may have just buggered off. So we're going to have yeah. to... Have to wait and see. Uh, but if, if you're there, yes. Oh, there we go. He's still with us. All right. Okay. Um, so you. so yeah. So the the, the the Sybil of Kumai was a um was in service to Apollo, and she was of course sort of ravishingly beautiful. Uh, and Apollo, being a Greek god, uh, as they are wont to do, wanted to seduce her. Wanted to to uh, to have to have his way with her. And so, um, in order to kind of gain her <laughs> to gain her. Uh, uh, her acceptance of this proposal, she, he said that she could have anything she wanted. And she asked to live as long as there were motes in a handful of dust. Uh, in other words, scoop up a handful of dust. She wanted to live that many years as there were, as there yeah. were pieces of dust. And so Apollo granted this wish, but she did not become Apollo's lover. She refused uh, his advances. And so, of course, this uh, wish that was granted became a curse and she lived for hundreds and hundreds of years. But she didn't live as she was. She didn't remain a beauty. She aged and she shriveled and she shrank and she desiccated. And so by the time the character in the Satyricon encounters her, she is in a in a jar or in a cage, hanging in the in in the house of a uh, 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 where where they've gone to to sort of have this um, gathering, and she is this tiny little husk, and so the the, the epigraph uh, says basically that I saw uh, I saw with my own my own eyes. The, the, the Sybil of Kumai hanging in a jar. And when the boys said to her, Sybil, what do you want? She answered, I want to die. And I think the inclusion of this as an epigraph sets a very stark tone yeah. for, you know, it, 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 it's, a, it's a framing device for what is to come. And it sort of sets you up to to kind of a, to kind of um, uh, have a certain mindset about what you're you're going to experience. Yes, um, a word a word that um, we've conspicuously avoided in our discussion of this poem that I'm gonna I'm gonna deal with now is nihilism. Um, now, obviously, when you open a poem with an epigraph of a tortured woman saying, "I want to die more than anything else." you may think that the poem is, well, I mean, how can you think it's not going to be nihilistic? But I don't believe that at any point in his life, T.S. Eliot would have gone near philosophical nihilism. Um, I mean, one, he was simply just too too smart for that, you know. <laughs> uh, but also because the poem is not really about hopelessness as such. It's about... If, if you will, it's kind of about a state of uh, Kali Yuga, if you want. Like, it's, mm. it's there, especially towards the end of the poem, that last section you heard Mr. D read, it doesn't say that it's never going to end. It talks about the flood, doesn't it? It talks about how there's going to be, it's going to be dry, there's going to be no rain, and then the world will flood. You know, it's a very biblical concept, you know, this idea of the world being flooded and washed new. Yeah. Um, and uh, so, yes, I, do not attach. I'm warning everybody. Do not attach nihilism um, to to Eliot, uh, but, and especially but, not to this poem. Right, but also I think you should understand. As I said, it, this poem is, comes in the shadow of World War One. I, I yes. mean, and, and Eliot and everyone else had watched basically an almost an entire generation of young men die, and he, they'd watched the breakup of of many political unions, many mm -hmm. ideas of of of, of the, the, the the basically the, the construction of the world. Yeah, the 1800s uh, is over. Yeah, fall apart. I mean, the 1800s is over. 
but also this uh, idea that history was over. I mean, if you think about it, this little epigraph, this the symbol of Kumai, this ancient beauty associated with, you know, the Greek gods, has become nothing more than, you know, she shrunk. Over the years, she shrunk. Her beauty left her. All her hope left her. Everything left her. She became this <laughs> tiny little freak show, this tourist attraction, hanging in a jar, longing to die. And I think that Elliot was drawing a very stark comparison to the state of certainly European civilization definitely, uh, at, at, definitely. What it, at what it had become. I mean, it yes. had become as her. Uh, uh, um, yes. So, and I think we should also just, just deal with the title of the poem. The poem is called The Waste Land. It's not, not called The Waste not the Land. Waste no, yeah, The Waste it's, Land. Yes. And, and I think that that is very, um, that's a very, also a very significant thing that we'll We'll come yes. on to later as we get into other symbols. Anyway, indeed we will. Um, and also, just just uh, just more onto what you said, the um, the world that. So again, I, I know we're going to get onto this, but I feel this is important to say now. Obviously, the opening of the poem talks about April being the cruelest month, and the reason that it opens with that is because the winter has ended, and the stultifying snow has come off. And in a sense, that is what this poem is is addressing: the fact that. This long Victorian winter, where where everything seemed everything seemed to be going in a certain way, and everything seemed so certain, has come crashing down. And really, that's where the modern world as we know it starts. It's it's the first world war has ended it, and now the spring is upon us. The the quote the, it's ironic because he's using the he's using it the spring to signify decay and rot whereas of course you know obviously spring is usually to, to signify new life and rebirth yeah. um I mean, and i th and there is um there is a, a there is hints at this poem at a cyclical conception of history um the the idea that as you said it reaches its end stage and then there are references towards the end of the poem to the flooding and the rebirth um and you know i'm elliot did write quite a lot about spengler in his later life um and uh, that, of course, uh, Spengler's great work had come out a few years earlier. Um, and it's certainly Eliot would have known about it. Um, so there is, it does, it does have an element of that. Um, but of course, that concept very much predates Spengler as well. So um, I wouldn't, I wouldn't attribute it to, to that much. Yeah. Um, also, uh, you want to want to just very quick note uh, that the poem is, you know, that Eliot is, is right off the epic the epigraph, has has dedicated the poem to Ezra Pound and called him Il Milior Fabro. Do you want to talk about that? Well, yes. Uh, Il, Il Milior Fabro means the better craftsman or the superior craftsman. Um, because, of course, as we talked about before, Ezra Pound made this poem, essentially, really. I mean, he, as, as, as you heard, Eliot was was pregnant with the poem and Ezra Pound was the, was the midwife. Um, he brought this forth... Um, he he, as I said, he edited it. You know, it, it would be unrecognizable now if he hadn't done that. It, he he cut it down by two thirds length. He he slashed whole pages. He he changed the entire tone and tense of whole stanzas. He he made edits to individual words and word order. He um, he told Elliot what had to go and what what had to stay, etc. I mean, he basically was the craftsman that, as I said took the rough gem and made it in, in, into a diamond. Uh. Yes, and um, uh, there is a, you can get a facsimile edition of the of, of Pan's um, uh, notes and and, um, and edits to Wasteland, and it's, it's very, it's quite enlightening. Um, the um, Very much worth buying. Very much worth buying if you can, if you can, if you can see that. Um, and also, that line "Emilio Fabro" is 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 in itself a a, a reference to Dante, and there are yes. many references to Dante in the Wasteland. So, yes, all right, uh, yes, uh, it refers to a poet called Arno Danielle, um, who Eliot meets in the uh, pur the Purgatorio. Purgatorio. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm going to get very autistic about uh, 
<laughs> catching all these references. Yeah, yeah, yeah if I you're mean, if you're it's... autistic about poetry, then this is your this is your jam. Yeah. You know. So um, very broadly, um, so we'll just you know going with the burial of the dead. I mean, Hat mentioned that the the imagery we're encountering at the beginning is. Um, basically, an inversion of this idea of what we would think of spring. If you if you think of uh, you know someone like Wordsworth again, mm-hmm. the host of golden daffodils, um, this idea of of the kind of springing of life being um, you know being something that's regarded with joy. Eliot, uh, being a modernist here, has basically inverted that and made uh, the spring and called the spring cruel. And as Hat said. Um, there's very much this image of hibernation, in, in, you mm. know, the sense that um, that the world was was plunged into a kind of crisis, but it was kept alive under snow. You know, this this idea of uh, of kind of hiding away something as long as possible in order yes. to avoid dealing with it. Um, later on, at the end of the burial of the dead, there is uh, there are some lines where the uh, where the character at that point calls to a man called Stetson and basically asks him uh, about a body he buried in the garden and, and mm. you know, is, is, it, uh, is it beginning to sprout? And I think that uh, the beginning of this section and the end of this section both being about this idea of something being hidden away, buried, protected, covered up, coming to light, the, you know, whether the... it's being, whether yeah. it's being clawed up by by the cruel hand of April, or whether it's being clawed up by the friend of man, the dog. Um, yes. Um, I mean, li- literally, the idea here is that it's a classic reactionary idea, and one that I think is essentially correct, is that society died, you know, basically sometime in the late Enlightenment, sometime in the, the, the late 1600s, the, the 1700s, and then the stretch of the kind of Victorian period of the world everything that we hate as reactionaries had already come to happen it was just it was just kind of uh you know when you have like a tumor but you don't know it yet you know and then all of a sudden the this this, this the symptoms appear after the mm-hmm. first world war if you will that's that that's the basic idea at play here it's, it's a very well-known um reactionary kind of trope uh, if you will yes and so um we're also we also encountered quite early one the first of many many different uh narrators many different points of view uh you know we we get this sort of premonition and then suddenly it's it's not just this sort of imagery of spring but it's the coming over the starnberger zee um the shower of rain the hof garden coffee sledding you know we're suddenly given uh, uh some very concrete images and 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 a character. Um, mm. In this case, uh, uh, Elliot was referring to a to a real person um, who was a, a, a countess. I think it was Countess Marie Louise von Wallacey Larich. Um, mm, yes. And if you want, you can actually read her um, memoirs. There are uh, that I I looked, and they're on Google Books, so you can read it for free. Uh, but Elliot is actually kind of quoting a, a, an. So, sort of episodes of her life here, uh, the sled and Marie, Marie, referring to Marie, mm. this this woman, the Countess Marie, um, and also you know Munich, uh, the Hof Garden is a is a is a public garden and yeah, was a public garden <laughs> park in the center of Munich, um, which Elliot it, would, have, it, would have would have been to. He visited Germany uh, a mm. number of times before the First World War, uh, so he right. would have known he would have known the kind of pre-war Germany, you know, the aristocratic uh, milieu. He met, as he, as he said, he, he met uh, countesses and all sorts of things. He, he, he stayed in the Hof Gardens and everything. Yeah, and again, this this is, um, so he's immediately contrasting this um, these first images of, 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 of sort of life and um, being, pull, being pulled out of hibernation with this memoir of, of someone who very much represents the old the old god of Europe, you know, mm. basically the kind of uh, this world that 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 was dying, and certainly had received a death blow at, at World War One, and mm-hmm. would be finished off certainly by the time World War Two ended. And you, um, you obviously can't have the word Archduke without the connotation of uh, Archduke Franz Ferdinand, who, as everybody will know, 
was shot uh, in Sarajevo that, that that kicked off the First World War. Um, very 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 blunt um, illusion there, I think. And of course, yes, yes. Uh, yeah. Elliot Elliot has lots of double meaning. So of course, in one because it's actually as Mister D said a direct quote from the memoirs of Countess Marie. But at the same time, of course, he knows that Archduke will immediately get everybody in 1922 <clears throat> and now thinking the Archduke, World War I, you know, etc. Yeah. Um, so, um, strangely enough, of course, as I sit here, I have an enormous bouquet of lilacs, which I picked, <laughs> uh, which had just come into bloom uh, to, 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 in, in honor of, uh, of reading this. Um, uh, so we go to, um, you know, the next section. What, what are the roots that clutch what branches grow out of the stony room? This is one of my favorite bits of uh, the wasteland because I think it's a great summation uh, of, as I talk about modernism uh, and, and the kind of modern condition. What, uh, what, what are the roots that clutch? What branches grow out of this stony rubbish? Mm -hmm. What is the root? What, what do you have left? What is the root of your culture? What is the root of your faith? What is the root? Of, of of your spiritual being uh that grows out of the stony rubbish i mean the the, the debris of the modern world yeah, um, nothing will grow yeah and son of man you can again very very specifically referring to the bible to ezekiel there um you cannot say a guess you know only a heap of broken images and uh and if there is a, a better description of what the wasteland is uh, besides a heap of broken images, I think very much kind of tells you what you're going to encounter. Uh, the poem is very you. much, very much that. Look around you, look, look mm. around you at, at the world, but also I think, the, and I, I think Eliot used this aspect of the poem being this sort of disjointed yes. set of images, set of characters, set of, narr of narratives mm. um, to, to mirror what he saw in the world. Uh, yes. Yeah. Um, and of course, Eliot has a footnote here. He references Ezekiel uh, two one, um, which is, "And he said unto me, Son of man, stand on your feet, and I will speak with you." Um, the the son of man there. Um, of course, you know it's this kind of stand up and like in a sense, Eliot is literally, you know, he stand up and I'm going to tell you. I'm going to tell you this mess, and I'm going to tell you, I'm going to show you the stony ground, and I'm going to ask you why there is nothing gr growing in it because there's no water and it's infertile and it's dead. Oh. Basically, it's a kind of it's an it's an exhortation to the reader, I think. Yes, indeed. Um, <clears throat> and then, of course, we get to um, you know that there, there are many sort of references to the idea of kind of shelter, mm. of, of of finding shelter. You know, the, whether it's the forgetful snow or the or the, the ground over the corks or the uh, mm -hmm. coming in under sh the shadow of this red rock, um, you know, uh, the empty chapel, the cisterns. You know, there are many, many images of these kind of pseudo shelters. Um, when we get to it, the um, the section about the typist, um, she's also very much just sort of living barely in this sort of pseudo shelter you know where she doesn't have a bed she doesn't have a place yeah. to kind of put her things and there's there's um a constant sort of repetition of this idea of non-place and, and, yeah. and again i think that refers so much to this idea of the waste land a land where everything is waste in other words everything is something out of place out of order that that has no that you has nowhere to put it it is rubbish it is meant to be cast off um, and we get the very famous line, I will show you fear in a handful, a handful of dust. dust. Yes. Yes, which is a which is a marvelously foreboding line, but also refers back Reference to Sybil. To the Sybil mm. of the Kumai, the Sybil at Kumai, yes. You know, who 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 thought she was going to find eternal life in a handful of dust and instead found fear. Mm. And um, there's a very subtle allusion as well with the red rock. Now, think where they have red rocks. It's in deserts. It's in arid places. It's where the sun has scorched everything, isn't it? You know, the kind of the uh, is it the the red rocks of the sort of Nevada or or North Africa or Middle Australia? You know, these these great red heaps of stone that are just yeah. bleached by the sun. I believe that's yeah. why they're red anyway. Um, <clears throat> oh, they they contain iron. That's why they're red. Right. I see. That's all right. 
Um, but yes, I, I think the the illusion is still there. Um, yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. Fear and hamper us, and then you 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 wonderfully read us this German uh, these few lines of German here. Yes, Frisch uh, vet David. So um uh, yeah, I think we should probably give translations of all the foreign languages. We will, right? yes. I missed the first bit of German, which occurs a a, a, a bit. Uh, bin gar keine Russen stammels litton ek Deutsch. Oh which yes, means, yes, yes, which is very is actually quite amusing. I, it it means I'm not a Russian, I'm a Lithuanian, a real German. Um, <laughs> it's a great line, isn't it? Yeah, it's a, it's a great it's a great line that that sort of pops in um, in the midst of the uh, evocation of the Countess uh, uh, Marie Louise's um, mm -hmm. recollections, uh, and we get this second bit, which is from Tristan and Isolde. Which is Wagner's famous yes. um, op? There are a number of references to Wagner. Yes, um, many references to Wagner. A key, key, uh, key, um, key artist, if you will, that appears in this. And yes, so obviously there are varying translations of Wagner, but the translation that Eliot references in his footnotes is by uh, Le, Le Galien, I believe is how you pronounce it. Yeah, Le Galien. Uh, the Galleon. So you got fresh blows the wind for home, my Irish child. Where do you tarry? Um, now, of course, tarry uh, means um, it's a, a, a well. <laughs> ta I mean, it's a it's a very archaic word, but it's a it, it means to kind of wait or be tardy, a bit like we were starting the stream. Um, yeah, as, as we always somebody, are, yeah. somebody should. I, I was very impressed because everybody in the chat was saying, "Hurry up, please! It's time." But uh, <laughs> unfortunately, unfortunately, nobody said uh, uh, "vo vo vilish do." Vilish do. Yes. Um, so, and, and, and Wagner should be remembered. I mean, I, I think uh, there is, uh, one of the one of the core thematic. Um, references in Eliot is to uh is to Celtic mythology yes. uh which we will talk about with um the Arthurian legends and and uh Eliot in in I think the first footnote says basically says he is so deeply indebted to Jesse Weston who had written a book called From Ritual to Romance which is a hmm. is a um a, an explication upon the grail legends and it's a very interesting book if you can get a hold of a copy of it but i mean elliot really heavily um leaned upon um these legends but of course this was also what wagner was doing i mean wagner was um uh, taking these sorts of european um myth and folklore and kind of you know pulling them in and using them as the basis for his own um sort of operatic narratives yeah. and and we're, we're very familiar with you know we we had um uh tolkien day on uh, am's channel of uh, last month so and uh, we're very familiar with J.R.R. tolkien again of being this uh, uh a scholar and a writer who kind of draws upon the same sort of myths and narratives and of course tolkien and wagner were both drawing on the same you know sort of sets of european myths and and tolkien indeed was also drawing upon Wagner as Eliot did. So um, there was a great interest in a great sort of um, revival of uh, a lot of these stories uh, around this time. Yes. Um, and I think something very important to grasp here, probably much to the annoyance of one um, Carl of Swindon, um, is that Eliot is very, he's, he's deliberately brewing a tea of kind of European Western civilization basically he's this isn't just about britain it's not just about england it's about western civilization which is the point that i've been trying to make for some time now is that none of our countries in the west developed in isolation they all feed into one another i mean this poem very consciously references english literature it references celtic myth we, it's referenced Germany and Wagner and the Prussian aristocracy. It references France constantly. It talks about Lithuania. It talks about Spain. There's, there's references to Spanish and Portuguese literature uh, later on. There's, of course, constant references to Dante in Italy and Christ. I mean, he, he's, he's 
mixing all this together because he knows that that really it forms a kind of cultural whole that informs each other. You know, nothing comes of a vacuum. <coughs> nothing comes of a wasteland. And he's saying that look at all these fruits that were born and now the, the ground is dry, the ground is dead. Nothing new is going to come of this. Indeed. Um, and then we again get another reference to, to a flower of spring, the mm. hyacinth. Uh, which is again a very sweet smelling flower that, that is one of the first to kind of poke up, mm -hmm. sometimes from the snow in the very early spring. And um, we get again a, a sort of reversion to a character who talking about this experience um, with a hyacinth god, again, not nature, but sort of man, a, a man made place, uh, like the Hof Garden, like a place where you would drink coffee and talk for an hour. This idea of civilization, uh, and again, the, this we get this immediate reference to the flower of spring. We get this reference to a memory of childhood, but then again, it goes off. I, it, you know, that it becomes you cannot speak, you cannot see. Uh, you, I was neither living nor dead. I knew nothing. Um, yes, which, which is a which is a which is a state that's referenced several times in various sections. It's, it's really, there's a real obsession with this idea of not being any one thing, but just blending between forms in a way that's horrible. I mean, you're going to see it's, it's coming up now. Um, there's constant references to cross dresses and the mythological character of, um, is it, oh, I always forget his name. He's very famous. I shouldn't, but um, I've read enough about him. Is it Tiresias? Yes, yeah, Tiresias. Yeah, Tiresias. Tiresias. Um, who of course was because of his because of his prophetic abilities, one of his punishments was that he was turned into a woman uh for seven years. Um and he experienced, you know, both both facets of, of, of being male and female. And you know, there's lots of other examples that that references that we'll come across. There's this idea that 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 things no longer things are no longer certain that that on on a basic level that that the man is no longer able to be a man and the woman is blending into him and all sorts of things are just are just losing their form and waving into others the idea that everything is kind of melting into just this chaos you know think of what we just read about there being no shelter the trees are dead they don't give any shade you've got to you know crawl under a rock because we all know that's what living in the modern world is like. All everything rock solid and certain has been stripped away. It all it all gets taken away from us, and we're left with just a blowing wind, a blowing chaos all around us. We don't know where to go. There's there's nothing certain anymore. Mm. Um, and I sh I should mention also um, the uh, the Grail uh, legend because that is a very uh, persistent theme in the wasteland. Um, so people are probably familiar with the, this, uh, the, you know, the Holy Grail with the Arthurian legend. Mm -hmm. um, in Eliot's sort of references, I mean, he references a medieval French writer uh, who was writing in I, I, I can't remember, about about eleven hundred, if I'm not mistaken, uh, or slightly before that, or Chrétien. Yes. And Chrétien is um, sort of the first to reference various aspects of the grail legend one of which is the fisher king um and so the the grail i mean we we know we have this sort of indiana jones image of the grail being the cup of yes. that joseph of Ar arimathea christ. held to ca catch the blood of christ but yes. before that the grail was 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 not so much a specific object as it was uh a, a, a basically a, just a, a a regular vessel it was a, it was a plate it was a sort of plate or bowl used to carry food to yes. table to to the table of the lord um so just briefly um the, the the grail in this you know in the earliest sense was this vessel which took on sort of holy significance it was uh it was directly referenced to 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 to, to god but it wasn't specifically the the grail that we've come to know in popular culture uh, but anyway, the, the Fisher King was uh, a, a, a member of a line of, of, of kings who kept this object, the Grail. Um, and they were entrusted with keeping the Grail. And this Fisher King, who isn't named, he's only named, I think, in later versions of the story. Um, he 
is the last of his line. He does not produce. He does. He does not have an heir, a son, and heir, because he was wounded. And the nature of his wound is never really revealed in the early stories. But it's it's basically described as a wound to the loins. Yeah. Uh, which is more or less basically a wound to the genitals. He, he he's was, impotent. He's, he's impotent. His genitals were, were were wounded in battle or wounded as a as a punishment. Um, and he cannot reproduce. And so very much in keeping with this idea that, you know, the medieval idea that the king is part of this great chain of being and very high on this great chain of being, if a link that high up on the chain is broken, then every other link below it is also broken. So, of course, if the king mm. is is barren, if he is unable to kind of fulfill his duty as the keeper and progenitor of the line of, of kings who keep the grail, then his entire kingdom becomes barren as well. And so yeah. that is the image that you're presented. And um, so the Fisher King, basically, he, he can't even stand up. He's his wound. The nature of his wound makes it so he's 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 hand, you know, he's crippled. Um, and all he can do, basically, is sit in a small boat outside of his castle and fish and wait because he does have the promise of a possible healing yes there um, is a prophecy yeah and so basically there's a there's the idea that if the right person if the chosen person asks him the right question then his wound will be healed and his land will go from yes. being barren to being fertile mm -hmm. again um the the character is is Percival also yeah. called Parzival, yeah, which the Arthurian uh, Percival. Yeah, the Arthurian Percival and Parzival is uh, Wagner, of course, wrote an opera about this Parzival, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, amongst other writers, it's a common theme. But but Percival was the chosen one. He was the one that was meant to ask um, the Fisher King the question. He actually goes to how to stay at the at the Fisher King's castle, and during the the meal, he sees the Grail, and in that in Chrétien, in that context, the Grail is a dish being brought to the table. And mm -hmm. what is in the dish isn't what you would expect. It's not food; it's the Eucharist. Mm -hmm. And we discover that the Fisher King is living only on by taking the Holy Eucharist. Um, and so the the significance of the Grail is related to this devotion to God is, is there. Um, Percival, of course, may, uh, he is reminded that he interrupts and causes problems. And so he decides that he's going to be very good and he's not going to speak whilst in the presence of this king. But yes. unfortunately, that was a big mistake because he, it, because he didn't speak, he did not ask the question that could have healed the land. And and various things happen later on, but I'm, I just wanted to give a short grounding if people have not heard of this character, because I think Arthurian legends and, and the Fisher King, this idea of the of the wounded king and the barren the barren kingdom are, are very important to Elliot. Yes, it's it's really uh, a central theme, if not the central theme, really, is um, this idea of the Fisher King with the barren land, but who can be restored. And of course, as as you hinted at there. Like for example, the, you know, he, he uh, Percival asks him the the question, and we never find out what the question is, because, and this is this is this is integral. The point is that we don't need to know what the question is. Just like we don't need to know what the Holy Grail actually is, yeah. all that matters is it's, it's the Holy Grail. It's the question that saves the kingdom. You know, it's it's as as long as you have the the concept, you don't need a specific form as such. Um, the form isn't really what matters here. Um, it's, right. it's, it's something that will become more clear as we go through the poem. Um, um, the, the question, by the way, is, is, is it ended up generally, is generally rendered as who does, whom does the grail serve? Or what is the purpose of the grail? Yes. Um, but in the original, in, in Chrétien's uh, version, you, we never learn what, 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 what the question mm -hmm. is. And, and Percival it ends up actually inheriting the kingdom after the fish king uh yes. dies but um yes uh and people also should be familiar with the these legends because these were also what 
authors like J.R.R. Tolkien drew on very heavily. I mean, yes. uh, the the um, uh, the, um, Ar- the character of Aragorn is very much the the chosen knight. He yeah. is the Percival in in that sense, and in, in that he is he can he can mend the broken sword. He can mend the broken kingdom, and just as in as in this uh, you know in the Grail legend, you know Percival is the knight who can who can mend the, the king's personal sword, so to speak, yeah. and bring uh, and bring life to the kingdom. So, all um, right. And then <clears throat> we have a line we should we should talk about, which is uh, "Ud Ud und Leer das Meer." I probably butchered that, but yes. yeah, yeah, and- Ud und Leer das Meer, yeah, which is from Tristan is older again, yeah. and it means uh, this. I I usually thought of it as meaning the sea is empty, but I learned from a. Uh, <laughs> Well, our, I our, a, our friend, <laughs> our our our, uh, our Germanic friend, that it actually means dull and empty is the sea, and not dull in yeah. the sense of boring, but dull in uh, without feature, formless, yeah. not worth it. Um, yeah. Yes. So again, you know that constant, the constant theme, the repetition that everything is dead. There is no sustenance. There is no water. There is no life. There is no vitality. It's all dead. It's all impotent. It it exists. It's all there. And like this is the thing: the 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 Fisher King and his kingdom are alive, but they're impotent. This is the this is the what Elliot is saying. the 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 modern world exists. Everybody walks around in it. We all live in this reality, but it's dead. It's dead on the inside. So the next section is uh, is a, 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 and we meet another character called Madame Sosostris, yeah. famous clairvoyant, and um, Madame Sosostris is one of a number of of seers or prophets that we yes. meet in the wasteland. Um, now you hat ha, had told me some sort of background about this yes. character. So Sosostris is a character from a novel by Aldous Huxley uh, called Chrome Yellow. And in that novel, um, Sosostris is, uh, there's a man called Mr. Skogan, and he takes this name because he disguises himself as a fortune teller in a carnival. Um, and he puts on a kind of cloak, and he disguises himself as an old woman. Of course, again, as I said, the theme of the theme of cross-dressing, the theme of a man blurring into a woman, as we will see going on. Yeah, which, um, was, also, which was also something associated with people who were given the gift of prophecy i mean there is in multiple kind of uh mythologies there is the idea that that a prophet is is someone who is astride who is at the line between two states in other words at the at the line between male and female at the line between life and death at the line between the this world and the next world it's someone on on the borderland uh who can who can who can perceive the scene and everybody, everybody, of course, hates the prophet because they're always right. That's that's why prophets always get killed and tortured because they're prophets. Yeah. Um, you know, most famous example, obviously, being Christ. Um, and of course, um, um, yes. Yeah, so in the in the story, Madame Sosostris, as this as the man calls himself, um, causes mischief. Um, he tells he tells characters things that are true. But that are he's doing it deliberately to annoy them um, and cause trouble. And what happens here is interesting because Elliot draws out this image of Madame Sosostris putting cards on the table, and of course, all the cards she puts on the table appear later in the poem. It's all yeah. f- it's all very direct foreshadowing to things that happen later on. It's a kind of it's a kind of musical signaling. You know, when you the the idea of in music you hear a melody just briefly, and then a few minutes later you hear it in full. The idea that you have to be kind of primed for it before you have it. And so here, here, here's the priming. It's uh, these, you know, yeah, the, you, you, the, so the you Phoenician get a, sailor. Yeah. yeah, you get a light motif. You, you, know, yes. you get these themes that, that come up again and again. And, and it's used in cinema all the, all the time. You know, you sort of associate um, various melodies and pieces of music and, and, and uh, with a character. And, and Elliot does this as well. It's interesting because, of course, you mentioned that Sosostris in Huxley is a kind of a, a, a false prophet, is a is a sham prophet. But yes. in 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 the wasteland, almost everything that Sosostris says comes to pass in the poem. 
all of these things come up and and all of them kind of prove true which is which is a very curious inversion yes they do um and so yes you'll see the as i said the phoenician um you have the 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 reference to the wheel we get we get a one-eyed merchant later in later in the poem yep. which we'll, we'll definitely talk about in more detail um <laughs> you get the death by water the hanged man crowds of people which crowds. we'll see literally in the next verse we get the crowds yeah um we yes. we also we also get an we also get one of the the first of, of several references to shakespeare uh particularly the tempest so this line is your card the drowned phoenician sailor those are pearls that were his eyes look and so in the tempest um ariel's song uh well there's a song that was that was inspired by a, a passage in the tempest and it's called ariel's song and um it goes full fathom five thy father lies of his bones are coral made those are pearls that were his eyes nothing of him that doth fade but doth suffer a sea change into something rich and strange sea nymphs hourly ringing his knell harp now i hear them ding dong bell mm. um so uh yes and um of course many one of many also water images in the poem yes um of course water is simultaneously i mean as it is in in life of course a giver of life and a destroyer um water either nourishes you and gives you life and you can't live without it you'll die if you don't have it as well everything um but of course it will also drown you it will it will destroy everything it will wash over and, and erase all memory of you um later on we'll see um phlebas who ha who elliot has drowning in the sea um on an adventure um you know because water is simultaneously a giver and a taker away um Yes, yes water, the very important motif. Yes, the the, the the stuff of life and 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 the stuff of death. But also, it's it's a it's it's also a, a realm. Um, I mean, the the I, there's there are many sailors in the wasteland, and the water, the sea, it, it's it's a realm that is of our earth, but it's also something that we that that excludes us. It's where mm -hmm. where we are not able to to go into the sea it's it's a, it's a kind of world that's bit, that's hidden and forbidden from us and the sea is, is the sea is always sort of depicted as dark the sea is empty the sea is the sea is featureless uh, we we think of, of of draws up images from homer you know of the of the uh, of the wine dark sea and and the and the idea that you must cross the sea uh, as a as a way of doing trade as a way of going to battle as a way of uh of, of, of traveling um so uh yes the 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 sort of multifaceted nature of water is is very important um yes. i should also mention that madame sosostris is she's reading the tarot she's got tarot cards mm -hmm. and uh elliot i i believe in one of his notes says that he doesn't really know anything about the tarot he's just using the light using the images because they're they they work for him Yes. <laughs> which is which is curious. Yeah. Well, I mean, at least he's honest. <laughs> yeah. Um, yes. And then we get Mrs. Equitone. Mm. Um, Mrs. Equitone. So again, so it's marked as feminine, and Equitone um, is, of course, I have to check because it's a very technical description. It's a musical concept. Um. Please. Uh, and it's annoying because there's also a product, uh, a construction. Yeah, product it's, it's not. It's not the product. It's not that. So an equitone is a regular tuning. Um, so that it's a regular major third derived from four fifths, thus two equal whole tones or equitones. Yes, two, two so it's, equal whole tones. Yeah. Yes. So again, what the idea that, of, uh, quite what that means, I don't know. I, I <laughs> this is uh, this is like, at, at a push. I think it's more about. The duality, the idea that you know two things blending into one, you yeah. know, it's two parts of one tone. But that's as far as I'm going to go. Um, um, I also think, of course, that this section begins and ends with the mundane. So, in other words, w the first thing we learn about Madame Sosostris, 
She's a famous clairvoyant, but she has a bad cold. So yeah. immediately we're given this idea of a seer, and then it's in, it's it's in in true T. S. Eliot fashion, it's it's smacked down to earth yeah. with that this is a woman with cold. Uh, but then she's the wisest woman in Europe with a wicked pack of cards, and then she gives, of course, these the more extraordinary, extraordinarily foreboding uh, prophecies, readings from the card, and then I see a crowd of people walking around in a ring. Thank you. If you see dear Mrs. Equitone, it go immediately snaps back into the mundane uh, again, uh, which is a uh, which is curious. But I mean, of course, that's you know. Uh, that is uh, the nature of, of of a seer, you know. Your, you know, and it, 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 it's it's the nature of Christ as well. I mean, again, Christ is a prophet. He was a prophet, but he was also a man, and so he had to deal with the things of the world, the stuff yeah. of life, the stuff of the everyday. Uh, and and so again, the seer as the person poised between two worlds has to go in and out of one or the other of them, and one of them is profound and one of them is is an utterly mundane yes yes indeed um and then we get the unreal city which you said um the unreal the brown fog of the winter um the crowd as, as, was, as was predicted um the reference to death had undone so many um yeah. which, which, which i which i assume Maybe a, almost a direct allusion to to the dead of the of it's, the world. It's it's a two. dual illusion. So there's that, but it's also a reference to the inferno. Um, ah, because of a particular translation that goes, uh, and there behind it marched so long a file of people, I would never have believed that death could have undone so many souls. Hmm. Um, reference. Yeah, and and Elliot has taken. Uh, as with many things in the wasteland, he has transposed these eternal uh, concepts and these classical literary illusions. He has is, he is transposed them upon the London of his day, the mundane, the crowded, the, the insufferable world of, of, of you know, the city, uh, the Europe of his day. Um, and so you know, which is um, again a, a hallmark of 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 a mod the modern sort of understanding. You know, uh, to 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 go from these lofty images down to you know London Bridge, King William Street. You know, you you're 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 given these eternal illusions, and then you're also grounded in a very specific place. I mean, these are all places in London, uh, as I, I said, to, uh, Mr. Hat. Uh, when we talk about this earlier, that I, I believe that Elliot lived near uh, King William yes, Street did. or near St. Mary Walnut, which is a church. St. Mary Walnut, if you have not been to London, is one of Nicholas Hawksmoor's churches that were built um, after the fire. Um, and um, it's a, it, it, the, the Hawksmoor churches are quite are, are quite interesting. So, uh, but I mean, it's a very specific place. Uh, so he's he's grounding it in, in in sort of imagery that would have been understood in his day. Yes. Um, and of course, the dead sound on the final the final stroke of nine. The idea that this this ancient church, which has kept the hours, you know, the dead sound, the kind of uh, the the dull, <clears throat> the off note on the nine. You know, this this just this quite quite mundane, but also you know symbolic image of. Uh, the the place being kind of tiresome and and impotent, you know, it's this idea that it's it's all alive. Everybody, the, the 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 bodies are alive, but the the insides are dead. You know, the dead stroke, the dead sound, the bell makes a dead sound. Um, and then we get this 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 interesting part where, uh, so there I saw one on you and stopped him crying, Stetson. And so immediately, we talked about this last night as well, the, the idea that it's a kind of uh, a common sight after the war would have been men seeing men they'd known in the army and sort of stopping them and saying, oh, I remember you from so-and-so and that sort of thing. And, of course, Elliot brings us back to the classical world because he says the ships at, at, at Milet where, of course, which was a, this, was, this was a battle between the Romans and the Carthaginians during the Punic Wars. Um, yeah. So it kind of he's taking us he's taking us all the way back from 
one European conflict to another. It's 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 men who were recently at war with the Germans, and he's taking us back to Romans at war with Carthaginians or Carthaginians at war with, with, with Romans. Um, and then you get the corpse you planted last year in your garden. Has it begun to sprout? Will it bloom this year? Or has the sudden frost disturbed its bed? So, of course, you've got this, this image of the corpse being planted. And again, just this constant repetition, this constant reminder that everything is impotent. Nothing will come. You you can plant a corpse, but it's not going to grow anything, is it? It's a corpse. It 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 doesn't have life. It doesn't it doesn't give life. It's dead. It won't sprout. It won't bloom. Um, um, but but it but it also I mean again uh, it also has the potential for life. I mean because of course out of death comes regeneration. Mm. I I think that you know um, we don't want to focus too much on this sort of sense that. Of, of hopelessness because i think embedded as you said within a lot of these things is the idea that there is a possibility of regeneration yes. um th this line is also very specifically referring to another literary work which is a, a play uh called the white devil by john webster i am i am a huge fan of these early 17th century jacobian Yes. what are often called revenge plays. And so there's people like Thomas Kidd and Webster and such, and mm -hmm. plays like the, the Spanish tragedy and uh, yeah. um, which, you it's, know, they're it's really, it is a pity she's a whore, yes. I mean, if you've never read these, they are absolutely horrible and brutal and <laughs> miserable thing. Um, there's a, um, there's a little, there's a little playhouse that was built called the John Wanamaker Playhouse uh, yes. in London. And it's a very tiny little venue. I don't know, it's probably been destroyed by COVID by now, but um, uh, it, it's you can go and see plays of this period performed there with, with candlelight. And it's a magical experience. But if you've never read any of these plays, they, they're quite brutal. Uh, and Elliot refers to a number of them in The Wasteland. Uh, this one is, he's actually calling up a, a, a scene from The White Devil where um, a, the character Cornelia, whose son had been killed uh, in, in a duel or in a fight, uh, is refused burial in a in consecrated ground. He's refused burial in a churchyard. And as, as Mr. Hat was, was talking to me earlier, this is also something associated with pagans. Yes, um, the idea of being... Um buried outside a churchyard. This, this has a number of, of significances. Um, as you know, this was often done, as Mr. D said last night, for paupers um, or people who had sinned in some way. They were buried outside the churchyard. But, but very strongly in European uh, art and literature, being, being deliberately buried outside a churchyard was a sign of pagan resistance to Christianity. The idea that if, if somebody had had forsworn Christianity or they, their family had remained uh, pagans after the, uh, the Christian uh, conversion of Europe, then they would deliberately be buried outside the churchyard, conspicuously buried outside the, the, the churchyard as a symbol of, of, of resistance, basically. Um, right. And then, yes. we get the, uh, then we get this very direct quotation. So I'm, I'm just going to read the bit from The White Devil. Um, Cornelius says... Uh, call for the robin redbreast and the wren, since o'er shady groves they hover, and with leaves and flowers do cover the friendless bodies of unburied men. Call unto his funeral dole the ant, the field mouse, and the mole, to rear him hillocks that shall keep him warm, and when gay tombs are robbed, sustain no harm, but keep the wolf far fence that's foe to men. For with his nails he'll dig them up again, and of course Eliot directly quotes that um, that section. That he swaps All, wolf for dog. Yes, he trans he he transforms instead of the foe to thence, instead of thence it's hence, instead yeah. of a dog a wolf it's a dog, and so instead of foe to men it's a friend to man. So he's domesticated the this image. Yeah, he softened you know. it. And of, it. of course, there's also an aspect of mon of mundanity here because the idea of like you know that dog's going to come and dig up the backyard again is such a kind of domestic 
trope, isn't it? You know, the dogs yeah. gonna dig up the veg patch or something. It, 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 he, he turns something grand into something mundane to, to illustrate, you know, the, the kind of the, the deadness of, of, of the modern world. Everything is kind of feminine and domesticated and you know it's a it's a dog rather than a wolf you know yeah and we get this again whole knot of 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 allusions to images that we've saw that we've seen it before i mean you know again as the line from the white devil goes um to rear him hillocks that shall keep him warm uh and covering earth in forgetful snow feeding a little life with dried tubers um it's sort of going back to this idea of the of of the sort of um something sprouting out of the of, of the of the warm hibernation uh, of uh you know of the earth and the fact of course the domestic dog your friend can uncover something horrid horrid yes. like a mm. body buried in the yard and then this section ends with a another direct quotation from Baudelaire's uh, Fleur de Mal he keep a creature lecture more semblable more more, more frere, you uh, which... hypocrite reader, my fellow, my brother. Yeah, yeah. Any idea why he would call up Baudelaire at the end of this? Um, I think it's to get that hypocrite reader. Um, mm. This is a, I mean, this is a very famous line. It's been, it's been referenced um, a number of times. Um, it's, it's really because he simultaneously is sort of calling out the reader but at the same time he is identifying himself with him um mm. which of course elliot isn't saying he's he's above all of this he isn't saying that he's any different from us that are reading it what he's saying is that you know um again it's it's a it's a difficult one because there's there's so many angles you can approach this from i mean hypocrite lector hypocrite reader I mean, basically, it's that it's that all all of your sins are mine, all of my sins are yours, in a sense. Mm. It, to, to to be extremely broad about it, there are people that will disagree. There are people that will say, you know, uh, got it wrong, but but really, that's I think that's what it is. Also, remember that it's it's an allusion to fleur de mal, and we've just talked about sprouting and bloom and yeah. flowers. Flowers, um, very good, and of course, yeah. fleur de mal is flowers of evil. Flowers so I evil. think what Elliot is doing is he's consciously using the phrase "flowers of evil" without 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 putting it to print. Um, mm. Basically, uh, the other thing, so, someone in <laughs> some a pink elephant in the chat has actually just put out of the strong came forth sweetness, which is a nice um, a nice yes. reference uh, to uh, which, of course, I always associate with <laughs> on your on your with, tins of Tate and Lyle. <laughs> I always associate it with yeah with treacle, yeah. but uh, treacle, but it is yeah, it is it is um yes it is from the Bible. So. Yes, it is. Oh, all right. So anyway, then we get we so we've we've been here two hours, but we're on part two, <laughs> okay. part a game two. of chess. So yes. so I I I uh, I do I shall say that I will need to. I have a half hour, and then I really need to start to wrap it up. Unfortunately, so uh, I see. I, I don't know. Uh, yeah, we could we could pick up the pace a bit. I mean, so this next uh, section, we discussed this last night. I don't think we have too much to say on it because I am in agreement with Mister D that it is a kind of poking at the imagists. And mm. the poets who were quite in vogue during the war, who wanted everything to be based around sensation, so that's why we get this uh, this kind of this kind of vomitus of vials of ivory and coloured glass unstoppered, strange synthetic perfumes, unduent powdered liquid, troubled confused, drowned the sense in odours. I think is the key line. Yeah, um, drowned the sense in odours. You know the 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 idea that your poem, which is trying to uh, become more powerful by appealing to the senses is just drowning the senses. And again, another reference to drowning. And I think, again, another aspect of modernity and that it being dead is that none of us are starving. None of us are really poor. You know, the point that we have, we have too much of everything is the point. There is too much luxury. There is too much comfort in the modern world. And I think this speaks to that. It's just an endless, essentially meaningless in some respects, tirade of of treats, 
you know the the words that are coming out you the glitter of jewels rich profusions um seven branched candelabra you know it's just he's just throwing luxury at you without well, it without it hitting i think yeah you say that but to me these are very specific luxuries these are not the kind of mundane luxuries of the average person in the 20s i mean to me these are sort of I, I would say there's an orientalist quality to, to, to this, right. uh, to this yes. type of room. I mean, this this is very much the luxuries of the harem, or or indeed he he is very specifically referencing um, Virgil in in part of this. I mean, there's a, a the story of how Venus is a, 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 um, in um, black in uh, the the Aeneid is yeah. trying to. Um, uh, mess with Dido and, e and Aeneas, and and so I I think that it's the line laquiaria, which is is just it's not some it's not an it's not something that you would have any modern connection to. It is something very specifically rooted in, uh, you know, in Virgil in the Aeneid in, in, in this case. And so for me, it's very he's very much you're right. I mean, conjuring up this sense of of kind of obscene sort of Miss, uh, sort of decadent luxury, but but also placing it, you know, in in a in a mystical mythical past or in, in another realm in a way. No. Uh, yes, I I agree with I agree with with what you're saying. I think, um, but it, it's also cryptic enough, and I think that at the same time it it lends itself to some confusion there. Um, yeah. I mean, you know, we, we, yes, I see what you mean. You know, these, these, as you say, not pleasures available to the type of person that will appear later on in this, in this part of the poem. Yeah. I mean, ca um, carved dolphins, you know, golden <laughs> cupidons. Come on. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but, but so, and I, I also get a kind of Cleopatra uh, thing with this as well. I, th I think there's a kind of reference to Cleopatra's barge. Um, another image another kind of reference that Elliot makes in this section will come up and become very important later which is philomel yeah uh, do you want to talk about talk about that a bit so philomel um we i think we mentioned part of this but the story of philomela um as it's often anglicized is a story written by ovid in the metamorphosis which is all about of course metamorphosizing it's all about transformation again you know the idea of this poem that all the forms are blending together and the certainties are dying. Um, so Philomela is a beautiful uh, woman. Um, and her sister is the husband of the king, uh, King King Tereus. And Philom Philomela is kidnapped, raped, and imprisoned by the king. And then to prevent her from telling anyone what's happened, he cuts out her tongue. So what she does is she weaves a tapestry which shows visually what has happened to her and sends it to her sister, uh, Procne, who is, uh, as I said, married to the king. And Procne sees this and she's absolutely enraged and she breaks her sister out, out of the prison. Then they take their revenge on Tereus because they murder, they murder his two sons and they feed the bodies of the of the child to the king uh as 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 a meal they 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 cook the 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 meat from the carcasses of the of the sun yeah. and serve it to the king it is a quite a quite a common motif in a lot of uh, medieval literature as well as classic yeah. literature and and given that it's the deepest lore and in honor of our absent host i'm going to make a really terrible modern reference I and uh, remi <laughs> and remind people uh that Arya Stark uh, from Game of Thrones did this with Walder Frey. She 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 yes. killed his sons and baked them in a pie and served it to him before she before she killed him. I should yeah. also I should also add a uh, uh, again with cursed references to modern works. Um, Bran Bran Stark, uh, the 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 crippled seer in Game of Thrones. Is oh. is draw, is drawn from these same images again of the crippled of the, of the Fisher King 
Uh, literally, the name Bran the Seer is yeah. is from Welsh mythology. So, uh, I hope you're enjoying so, this academic occasion. <laughs> so, <laughs> so uh, George R. R. Martin was also taking from the same sources as uh, yes, but that um, that fat draft dodging hack George R. R. Martin. Yes, and to get, and to get even more academic agent, uh, Roderick Embarks uh, mentions that. Cartman in South Park also does this with uh, <laughs> with uh, what was the name of that kid? I can't Stop remember that. Defiling kid. Elliot what South that, Park. What was that kid's name? Oh, um, truck, trucks he, are going wild. He he. he I, I made you eat your parrot. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, me. okay, back to the oh, uh, back to the sorry. wasteland. <laughs> sorry, Han. <Hans. laughs> Anyway, yes, that's the reference. It's the story of Philomela, who is called Philomel here by the barbarous king. And so at the end of the story, uh, after they've done that, they, they tell the king that they're so outraged with what he's done that they fed him his son. And he, he tries to kill, he, he runs at them, about to kill them both. And then all three of them transform into birds. They all just transform into birds, and that's the end of the story. And I, 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 I have a translation here. So, so the, the king is, you know, he's running through the hall. He's about to like, he's about to kill these two women, and all of a sudden, suddenly they were flying. One swerved on wings into the forest. The other, with the blood still on her breast, flew up under the eaves of the palace. And Terius, charging blind in his delirium of grief and vengeance, no longer caring what happened. He too was suddenly flying, on his head and shoulders a crest of feathers instead of a sword, a long curved beak like a warrior transfigured, with battle frenzy dashing into battle. He had become a hoopoe. Philomela mourned in the forest a nightingale. Procne lamented round and round the palace a swallow. Oh, swallow, swallow. Yes. Yeah. That's and the we... that's from that's from the Ted Hughes uh, version of uh, yeah. Metamorphosis. Oh, oh, okay, yes. Ted, Ted Ted Hughes again. Connection. Uh, yeah, and we we and, and 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 Elliot will refer to these characters and the events of the story again later in the poem. Uh, also, a, another recurring theme in the wasteland is bird songs. Um, there there are lots of birds in the wasteland, um, and we 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 were talking a bit about. The significance of birds in classical, uh, classical works. Yes, um, it's a I mean, very literally Aristophanes wrote the <laughs> birds. <laughs> yes, Aristophanes wrote the birds, and we had a wonderful conversation about the frogs as well, didn't we? Well, <laughs> because, well, because because um, uh, again, we're going to have to do a stream on the ancient Greeks, uh, various at some point. But Aristophanes is my favorite classical playwright and my favorite classical play is the frogs because the ancient greeks and the latin authors who took after them were obsessed with animal motifs and making stories out of animals and also the sound that animals make that's why in this poem you get the twit 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 jug 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 because it's meant to be the bird calling yeah. um that you would get an ancient greek play and it's rather wonderful because i won't go into too much you dug because it's not really that that relevant but in Aristophanes's play, The Frogs, which of course fro <laughs> frogs are a very relevant animal to us in this Whee! community. <laughs> Is that what they did? Whee! No, unfortunately, no. They well, it's 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 even better in a way because because they because all the frogs they appear on the stage and they go They they literally go kek. The frogs go kek in in Aristophanes. Yeah, Yes. We Wonderful. did, we, and we did find we did find a very literate Pepe meme that referenced. The frog. Yeah, there is there is a meme. There is a meme. Uh, if, if if you type in Aristophanes frogs meme, it'll come up somewhere. So anyway, uh, um, yes. All right. Um. So, uh, in true Elliot fashion, I mean, <laughs> uh, we we've talked about this, and again and again, this happened, where you're give you're you're sort of led off into the ether, you know, into these the heights of kind of. Uh, of, of 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 mythology and 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 history and transcendence and then he plops you back down to earth again you're yes. literally the cat licking the rancid butter in the gutter <laughs> uh, 
to, to take an image from another of Eliot's poems. Um, yes. So we were given this this extraordinarily florid passage about this room and the perfumes and such. And then what do we what are we given as the dialogue to, to, to come out of this room? But the next section, the next section. So we have a woman. Hey, you're going to have to scroll up. We're, uh, we're just, just before this. Uh... <laughs> I, like, Go on. I like that AA is like the deus ex machina. <laughs> I know. <laughs> just the, he's, the, he's the producer. It's a radio the show. This ghostly... Never this speaks. Go he, he, just, he just operates it. There we go. There we go. That's it. The ghostly feminine hands operating the... Yeah. So yes, Mr. D and I had good fun reading this. It's uh, So we have we have a woman who is speaking to a man and the woman is complaining. She's complaining and she's talking because she says her nerves are bad and she just sort of talks and she keeps questioning the man and she asks him what he's thinking. And of course <laughs> he just, he just goes, I think we are in rat's alley where the dead men lost their bones <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> because, because he's a single male. And that's, you know, he's on the grind, I guess, but, um, but no, um, he, uh, is he ignores the questions of the woman, and this feels like it's leading somewhere profound. Of course, we think that you know what is this man leading up to? What are these strange thoughts? And then she finally says, "Is there nothing in your head?" And then he goes, "But oh, 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 that Shakespearean rag! It's so elegant, so intelligent," which is um a very curious uh, bit of the poem because so the. It's, it's meant to be comedic. It's meant to be a classic Eliot anticlimax. He was a master of the anticlimax. And it's the whole point is that there's nothing profound in this man's head. It seems to be. But then we look inside and he's just singing a popular old tune. Like this is... So the Shakespearean rag was a popular jazz hit. That's what, no, not jazz, a ragtime hit right from time, 1912. Yeah. So the equivalent to this now would be like, I don't know. It would be like singing an early 2000s pop tune, Oops. like in your head. You know? Oops, I did it again. Yeah, it's 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 like it's like having that in your head when you look inside. You know, it's <laughs> it's just a it's a it's a it's a it's a popular tune from yeah. from from sort of the middle middle sort of years ago. We um, did look for a recording of it, and we I don't. It's not well, extant. The, right. the fascinating thing is that the only thing that <coughs> survives of the Shakespearean rag is a cover, a cover from the, the lyrics that you would have bought in a, in a music shop. Sheet um, music, that's, yeah, yeah. Yeah, the sheet yeah. music for it. And that's it. We don't have a recording. We don't know mm. what the lyrics said. We just know that it existed. And if it wasn't for Eliot mentioning it offhandedly in this poem, it would have been lost to time completely, probably. Like, we... we, we Nobody would know that it ever existed. You know? Yeah, and it's a, it's a it's a scary thought, isn't it? The idea that something like that was a hit song in 1912 could be completely lost to memory, except for an offhanded reference in a famous poem. Well, it's very much keeping with other you know with other things that we find in the wasteland. I mean, of course, the description of of what the detritus of London, you know, the cigarette papers and and uh, and and rubbish, you know. Uh, the, these these fragments I have shored against my ruin. I mean, this is literally the heap of broken images. You know, this is some this is some fragment that has found its echo. I've always found um, just to 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 cast my mind back to a, to an earlier literary work. Um, I was always um, I always find it very profound reading Samuel Pepys's diary. You know, written in the 1660s. Yeah, when he, there would be a section where he would quote some not great personage, but just some a, a, like a like a random event. So there there is a diary entry where he transcribes what the uh, what the the lampman uh, who who who, uh, who comes to call the time and uh, extinguish the, the street lamps, uh, and so he says, "I hear out my window and and." Uh, the the you know the um, the lampman calling and saying it tis tis you know tis twelve o'clock and a frosty night it is you know 
Yeah. And so again, th this is a man who who you know who was walking the streets, doing his job, calling calling out the time and the weather. And Peeps captured this moment for eternity. You know, this this offhand moment uh, was 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 basically trans trans um, figured in literature to you know uh, and 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 sort of cemented for eternity. And I think we get some of that in. Uh, you know, in Elliot, there's another bit where he's there's a song, the soda water, that Elliot cannot. He says that he heard it somewhere. He heard this song, but again, it, all that's left of it is uh, is its appearance as it washes up amongst the the sea of images. Yes. Um. So then we go on to. Uh. Uh, just a few lines. The hot water at ten, and if it rains, a closed <coughs> car at four. And we shall play a game of chess, pressing lidless eyes and waiting for a knock upon the door. Um, and this is this is apparently Elliot says a reference to uh, something called "Women Beware Women," another Jacobean tragedy mm. um, by Thomas Middleton. Um, ah, yeah. Yes, it's uh, it's another brutal play full of like murder and rape and people just being defiled, like so many of these are. <laughs> um, and uh, and yes, that's uh, that's also, what it's a reference to. These lines, uh, this this bit, and if it rains, and we shall play a game of chess. This these are also the lines that Elliot changed uh, at the request of Vivian, his first wife. Mm. Uh, because apparently, you know, we don't know exactly the reason that she wanted them changed. Uh, perhaps she felt that they revealed too much about their their marriage. I mean, you would never yeah, get any rothic, yeah. Marriage. <laughs> but I mean, you know, in, in the in the I can't remember what the lines were that he, that he changed, but they were very similar to these. Um, there's a reference to the ivory chessmen, I believe, yes. uh, or ivory men, or something. But that line was removed. Yeah. And then we get on. The Lil's husband. Yes, the great fun I had reading this. Um, I mean, obviously, it's a kind of comedic interlude, if you will, um, where you just get a woman gossiping <clears throat> in a pub. <clears throat> and then as she's gossiping away, the voice of the barman is calling from the bar going, hurry up, please, it's time. One of the most famous lines from the poem. Yeah. Um, and, you know, people probably heard me do it earlier. Um, you know, it's a sort of uh, that's if you listen to T.S. Eliot reading this, he performs it like that. He does it now. Albert's coming back. Make yourself a bit smart. This kind of cockney uh, pub wife, you know, just you do it. Around. You, you do it a lot better than Eliot. does. <laughs> Got to give it your all, you know, um, <clears throat> it's it's, you know, they're talking. They And again, it's funny. It sounds like a sort of funny sitcom-esque com sort of conversation, but they're talking about really horrible stuff. Yes, they're, I mean, so, it, 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 you, you say you that, know. I mean, it is humorous in, in the fact that, of course, we get this voice, but it is a very dark passage, of course, if you yes. want to talk about that. It is. So we get this woman who's telling her friend or, or some acquaintance of hers that her husband is being demobilized from the army and he's coming back home. And he had given her money to get a new set of teeth with. Um, and she um, she didn't. She clearly spent the money on something else. And the woman is saying, listen, if your husband comes back from four years in the army and you don't look pretty, he's going to go and find someone who does look pretty and have, and have a good time with them, um, is, what, is what she's saying. Um, and uh, she she says it basically. If your husband leaves you because he doesn't he doesn't f f find you attractive anymore, it's your own fault, and you should be ashamed. Um, and then uh, and then she says that she took pills. Yeah, uh, this to is bring the... on an abortion. Yeah, she she took pills to kill off a pregnancy because she's had five children already, and the last one nearly killed her, and she didn't yeah. think she could she could survive an, another pregnancy, which was. It's something which at the time would have been a very common fact of life. In the in the nineteen twenties, pregnancy was still a very dangerous thing. Um and you know there was wasn't a huge amount that could be done if it was gonna be a bad one. Um especially the birth. I mean, 
you know, quite a decent chance that she wouldn't make it out alive if it didn't go well. Um, but then, of course, she passes over that. The fact that this woman tried to kill, <laughs> tried to kill her baby. And, and again, I know that it says she's had five children already, but there is kind of a very stark reminder of the the lack of fertility of the wasteland. The idea that yeah. you're not going to have any more <clears throat> any more children. That she has to ki- she will kill her own baby rather than give birth to it. Yes, um, and, and 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 she's very much the kind of feminine echo of the male. Uh, infertility or the male barrenness that we find referenced with the Fisher King. Uh, but of course, Elliot in his own particular way twists, you know, the, the woman into an even more pathetic character. I mean, I've always been struck by the fact that the wasteland is haunted by many horrible women. You know, <laughs> it's very, yeah. it's, it's very woman pilled, uh, uh, so to speak. But yes, I mean, she, she, unlike the Fisher King who is wounded and cannot fulfill his duty, duty as a man she is literally killed trying to get rid of her child to save herself rather than so her concern is not for her progeny and her legacy but it's for herself Mm. yes exactly it's just for her um there is a sense of (laughs) self-preservation over the children when to be blunt really it should be the other way around yeah um um, and um, this section, I also feel, you know, there there are there are many other places w- where there is this idea of the of the dead waiting in purgatory, you know, the crowds of people milling round, yeah. um, and and of course we have explicit references to the purgatorio, but um, I've always gotten the slight feeling about this that that this is also kind of a conversation in purgatory. And you get the voice of authority, you get the barman inter- interjecting with these, hurry up, please, it's time, hurry up, please, it's time. Um, you know, I, I, I get echoes of, 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 of something, uh, of, of a different type of scene. Uh, I don't know whether that was intentional or not, but um, it's certainly there. Mm. Yes, and the, the idea that, that somebody is, it gets more and more, it gets more and more constant. It's hurry up, please, it's time. Hurry up, please, it's time. And yet, yep. they're just wasting their time gossiping about nonsense. They talk about gammon and having yeah, dinner, gammon. hot gammon. And then and then finally, just good night, Bill. Good night, Lou. Night, mate. Night, ta-ta. Night, good night. Um, and then, of course, the line from Hamlet, which is spoken by Ophelia not long before she kills herself, yep. which is good night, ladies. Good night, sweet ladies. Good night, Good night. So all of a sudden, it's a kind of very, like you can imagine this being read, and the audience just kind of goes quiet, you know, because all of a sudden it's you know, you know. Yeah, and I I think, (laughs) yeah, and I think Ophelia, I I mean, had just been talking about um, um, laying the body, uh, uh, laying a body in the cold ground. I I think that's the line. I, I have to pull it up. Yeah, I hope all will be well. We must be patient, but I cannot choose but weep to think they should lay him in the cold ground. My brother shall know of it, and so I thank you for your good counsel. Come, my coach. Good night, lady. Good night, sweet lady. Good night. Mm. Um, and, of course, the association of Ophelia with flowers and plants and herbs, and with water and with drowning. Yes. I mean, she drowned herself. And, uh, you know, the the, the Death by water, uh, I think, again, are piling on these references and images to this sort of central theme of the flow of water. Yes, definitely. Um, and just just the idea that, you know, in the words of, of Mr. Hitchens, it's all over. <laughs> it's all over. It is all over. Also, I noticed that uh, Lumberg has made reference to a particular famous <laughs> Monty Python sketch that you rather like, with a word that we but can't say. My best friend. <laughs> Mrs. Ooh. Gamer Word Beta. Is... Yeah. Can I say the word? No, I'm not going to say. No, it. we can't say it. We can't yeah, say but, it. Uh, yeah, AA is probably steaming right now. We did talk about that. Is that you? You when you read this section of the wasteland, you do have to be very careful. Or you lapse into Terry Jones. Monty Python, yeah. Yeah, you lapse into Terry oh, Jones. Oh, come help me! She's got to play a fatal war! Oh, bloody hell! 
Well, how did you become king then? <laughs> the Lady of the Lake. Well, exactly. Of course, of course yeah. we get the Arthurian legend in Monty Python as well as in the Wasteland. Yeah, it all—it all, it is rather symbolic, isn't it? Quite close to Elliot in many ways. Um, oh, all right. You are a proper fool. <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, uh, we need to we need to pick up the pace, don't we? So, uh, the fire the fire sermon we're at now. Oh, do you think we could charge through the fire sermon and fight? Well, I'm getting a bit worried. Um, so, what are we? Let's we're gonna have to make a decision here. I mean, I doubt we're gonna we're gonna get allowed a part two by Mister Agent. Um, is the I agent mean, going to give us? Is the agent going to give us? Well, I mean, we we have we have like soldiered through this. I mean, I don't want I don't want to rush. I don't want to rush. No, no, you're right. We 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 can't we can't rush. We can't rush. Oh well, he's put the super chats up on stream. Okay, so should we? All right, so well, shall we? Shall, shall we? What, do, do you think we'll? Have, I mean, we could always do another part. I mean, if he won't let us do it, we could do another look, part. We're we're elsewhere. we're pretty much. We're actually at the exact halfway point of the poem. Yeah, which is the start of the fire sermon. So if we were going to do it two parts, it would it would make a a lot more sense to just stop here and keep going. Yeah, I mean, I really wish I could stay, but unfortunately, I I, I do have an engagement. Um, well, uh, academic occasion. Let us know in the sidebar or in the chat before we do the super chats now um, if you would let us have a part two or not. Is he doing? I don't know, but yeah. does he does he know that he's got his whole screen shared? Uh, <laughs> this is very strange. He right. said he says Z yes. Yes, okay. So we're gonna get part two. All right. Part okay, two of Elliot hat. will still happen. Yeah, so are we gonna do the we you wanna read this you wanna do you wanna alternate if you wanna I'll, do them or do you want me to do them? I've now? I've actually never done a super chat before and I'm very excited to do this for the first time. Okay. Um all right, so uh Alright, so well why don't you start? All right. Uh, well, I'll wait for the vortex of Cthulhu <laughs> yeah. on, on, on screen to balance out a bit. Um, what? 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 What is beyond the last visible dog? Now, there's a deep lore reference. If anyone gets it, uh, I want to see if anyone gets it in chat. Uh, what? What is beyond the last visible dog of AA screen? <laughs> You're gonna, you're gonna have to. I mean, unless we, I, <laughs> I don't know what I'm looking at. This is like an abstract painting. <laughs> I don't know where to start. Yeah. Um, is A still there? I don't know. He's, he's. Uh... Um. Oh, oh. Something happened. Uh. Okay. So he wants me to read this one. Okay. All so right, it says. This. So Shinobi. The six US dollars says, AA, what are the panel's most inspirational books for the white pills? Druid High Performance had Carlyle's on hero worship in their top self development book list for his inspirational rhetoric. Um, well, the number one white pill is the Bible. Go and read the Bible. Um, don't read about Druids, go and read the Bible. Um, for a ever for the everlasting hope of man. Uh, first of all, um, any good white pill books, Mister D? I mean, that's a, certainly a good one. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> that, that's a, that's a, that's that's probably a better better than anything I could come up with. But um, you um, know, uh, I mean, you can certainly any... read. I mean, you can certainly read some of Elliot's later work if you if you want to yeah. stay stay on topic. Um, you, you know, uh. Read the four quartets. The four quartets, definitely. Anything by Chesterton. Anything by, like any Christian. <laughs> it's 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 by nature uh, white pilling in a sense. Um, uh, all right, Narco Republican for three U.S. dollars says, "I wish that in the room where my corpse is exposed and the temple during the funeral rites, a large sign be placed in view of all displaying liberalism is a sin." And that was said by Saint Ezekiel Moreno y Diaz. And <laughs> AA has oh. turned off the super chats. Oh. Is, is that all of them? Is, is I don't think so. There's definitely more. I've seen a lot it's more. Oh, here more. we go. This is this is better. This is better. All right. 
right i can actually see this so right who's next uh who's next? Ru uh Ru ruibos tea enjoyer for four pounds 49 uh That's just exciting. left an empty empty super chat thank you ruibos tea enjoyer hope you're enjoying your ruibos i like a good red bush myself uh don't don't read too much into that um Bourge, bourgeois aka billy at the back i believe that says for two u.s dollars says for a future pre-socratics and sophist deep law yes um certainly i'm sure we could do that uh, pre-socratic philosophy i know a lot about that i've got a whole collection of pre-socratic work uh i think we oh no no oh we're going up okay uh d's bit of rough for two pounds can you both turn me into a wasteland oo woo no, don't take the break. Don't take the break. <laughs> Are we going to ever find out who D's bit of rough actually is? I, I don't. I don't. I don't. What, what if it's AA? That would be hilarious. Right. Um, <laughs> it would be. Um, enlightened despot for 10 Canadian, I believe, uh, dollars. Says, reading aloud puts us in good company. The Library of Alexandria was, I hear, deafening with the sounds of patrons reading out loud. Hmm. Yes, and um, for many hundreds of years, that was the primary way people absorbed <laughs> literature. You'd hear it. You wouldn't read it. Um, yeah. Most people weren't taught to read. Um, one of the reasons that Don Quixote uh, became such an instant classic all over Europe was that men would take a copy into a pub and they would read a chapter a night. So they would read the book aloud to the pub and everyone would enjoy it. Um, poetry would be, would be read aloud. Um, do you remember we were on a stream about two years ago with Poe the Person, and we were saying that, well, she, she, she said, if you don't teach the plebs to read, how will they enjoy Shakespeare? And mm. you and I both said that, well, you don't have to read to enjoy Shakespeare, of course. Because no, it's, that's why it's, you, draw, it's a play. That's why, it's yeah, that, that's, that, that's why the groundlings loved it, you know, because it, it, was, it was a play. Um, yes, and, anyway. and the, spoken, the spoken word and the written word have very, very different connotations. And I mean, yeah. in, in some, you know, in many cases, um, they were entirely separate. I mean, there were people who composed for, for, to speak and who yes. couldn't write at all. Uh, Indeed. You don't, you don't have to be literate to write music. Um, so uh, we got uh, James Carter for two pounds. Two pound for Mr. D. He looks good in white. Um, Thank you. Yes. Did you? So, what? What was the inspiration behind your uh, black and white? Uh, I avatar? wanted to. I wanted to use the bleakest one that I that I had. <laughs> so I picked that one. April is the cruelest month, indeed. Um, yeah. Ooh, stop so it. We did that one. We did. What? what, what, what? You're right there. Oh no! I'm just. He's scrolling. I can't. Um. So we did that one. Lady of Shalott, your friend. An there. Another. Another lady who who floated off. <laughs> in a river, or down the river, you know, and like that's, Ophelia. That's, that's a poem we could certainly do. I'm, I'm, I adore Tennyson. So yeah, I love Tennyson. Do that. I love curse Tennyson has come up. The mirror cracked from side to side. The curse has come upon me, cried the Lady of Shalott. Um, uh, we, we, we could do um, eating the lotus day by day. Yeah, <laughs> we could, we could see the lotus eaters in honor of our. Friend we could, Carl. we could. The lotus eaters came. We could do uh, half a league, half a league, half a league onward, all in the valley of death. Road the six hundred. Um, yeah. So, oh, uh, yeah. oh yes. yes, as um, as Fishy Frenzy says, I, I'm, uh, I am D. I've come back to you now at the <laughs> turn, at the at the turning of of the tide. <laughs> yeah. Duh, 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 duh. There he is. Ugh. All right. So, Lady of Shalott, four pound forty nine says. So sorry, I can't watch this live, but I must sleep. Very much like the Lady of Shalott, of course. <laughs> very, very, very <laughs> ironic. Exactly. Sleep from which you will not sleep, wake. Don't sleep in a in a boat, darling. Yes. AA, can you scroll back to the super chat so I can read the rest of it? Oh, <laughs> hello, Terry. There it is. Uh, shit, what? No. <laughs> what are, you are you doing this on purpose to screw with us? Right. She says, I must sleep. I wonder what Elliot would have made of Don the Pleb. Huge <laughs> thanks for discussing Elliot's masterpiece. Well, of course, you call it Elliot's masterpiece, but it's not. It's Don the Pleb's masterpiece. Stop it. Stop it was it. established last night that all reactionary ideas were thought up by Don the Pleb. 
All right. And if you if you use them without crediting him, it's plagiarism. Okay. Exactly. Let's just get that straight. All right. And 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 being fish people, I mean, we ought to know about this. All these water. Yeah. Images. Well, because of course, here in the Isles, we all mate with fish. It's just what we do. Indeed. Um. So we got. Wow, J James Carter is quite the super chatter today. He's got another yeah. two pounds for the deepest law seventeen old footage of London, which is an, a classic of, of yours and I, Mister D. Do you remember Christmas? Oh yes, 20? yes. Oh, oh, that was wonderful. I've always wanted to do another one of those. I mean, we we sort of wonderful. did one of the Christmas of the of the of those films. I actually have uploaded a whole bunch more. Of those information films to do, but we uh, we never we never Wonderful. got around to doing it. Do you remember? Who I, was I, I always well, I wanted to do I wanted to do one on Odyssey because the problem Copyright. is we can't. Yeah, we can't do a lot of the good ones because the fucking BFI copyright strike. Yeah, yeah. And British Pathé. Yeah. So do you remember anyway. uh, we Chad Connors, the guy that like helped Chad. all those young boys get away from crime. <laughs> Chad Connors. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Chad Connors. Um. Right. So. Uh, Old footage of London. Two pound for Andrew Marvell. There we go. Yay. Another one in the Marvell jar. It's going to be the highest grossing stream of all time after about two years. You know, we're going to get there in the end. Um, oh. What? Uh, what no. are you doing? <laughs> Who first? Oh. Uh, all right. So there's another super chat from Aaron Dussel. For one ninety nine USD, yay for part two. We'll, uh, we'll get there. We'll get there. Oh, the rest oh, of the oh, oh, look, there's one from someone called Kai's. Yes, I was going to say uh, hello, darling. Um, very glad you could. Very glad you could view. Um, that's uh, that's the soon to be Mrs. Hat there. Um, in case anyone doesn't know, uh, for one ninety nine USD, more of this in the future. Culture the normies the eye yes this is this is the point because many people would would have not read the walk the wasteland had do it had they not seen the stream they would not have known of it they would not have known the deep lore behind the the things um aa has just sent me a message saying mention that i'll be on the pete quizno show at 7 p.m <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, I, I call him pete quizno's Queen um, Quinones, I think. Quinones. <laughs> did we did we read all the super chats? Well, I, I, no, we haven't got there yet. We haven't got okay, there yet. Okay, because Yiz also says that we should check entropy. So yes, we'll do that. Uh, yes, that academic ages will be appearing on the Peter Quinones Quiznos show uh, tonight at seven o'clock UK. Um, nice. He's currently got some cucumbers on his eyelids. He's got his beauty pack uh, <laughs> on his face. Getting ready, trim, trimming his beard with the Turks uh, to get you ready. See him with a towel wrapped around his head in a in a daiquiri, you know. Just, uh, yes, you know, <laughs> lounge, lounging lounging in his dressing gown in a Turkish bath. Mm. All right. Uh, anyway, so I think this is the so super chat here from Yiz the Eunuch, three US dollars for Panama Hat's first super chat reading. Heart, thank Yay. you very much. Yes, thank you very much. Yes, I'm enjoying this very much. I'd like to do this in the future. This is wonderful. Um, all right, now I'll just wait for the rest of them. Uh, just uh, talk amongst yourselves. You, uh, Saruja! Any, any anything to show, Mr. D, coming up? No, no, I mean, uh, no, no, uh, nothing. Oh. Uh, I mean, hopefully, oh, that, we'll no, that wasn't all the super chats, was it? No, <laughs> <laughs> <What's> amazing. <laughs> <laughs> was that all the super chats? Yes, I don't know it if it was, was, but okay. I don't think we. Well, got well, it. listen, everyone. I thank you for tuning in. <laughs> I mean, I, I have had an absolutely delightful time uh, talking about this. I've wanted to do a stream on uh, Elliot and and poetry for for a long time, and I know Hat has as well. And I mean, with yeah. the, the enormous success of the Marvel stream, um, hopefully, the next time we can get that esteemed academic. And literary scholar, scholar and uh, famous plagiarist. Hang on, now. <laughs> academic agent. Hang on, on, hang on, hang on. There's another super chat here. It's oh. in the chat. It's for it's two USD from Great White Lobster, and it says better than Batman. Sorry, AA. Oof. So there you go. That's uh, someone paid just to make make sure you know that. Well, there you go. Well, I, I, thought, 
I, I thought the Batman streams were better than I uh, assumed they would be. Um, mm. So, uh, but anyway, uh, academic agent, the chat wants a link to the Quiznos stream. They want a Quiznos link. If Hat was the super villain, he'd be. <laughs> what would my superpower be then? The bookworm is that? Is that a Batman villain? I don't know. There was there was a Superman villain called um, called like he was he he was like a man in a suit with a with a tandem who wanted to like make society back to like nineteen oh two again, mm. and he would like ride around and like force everyone to dress in like Edwardian clothing. I always thought I'd, I'd probably be that guy. <laughs> be. I, I, I think I think he was literally called like the Monocle or something. Yeah. Um, All right. Well, um, thank you everybody for tuning in, and I hope that we've uh, we've done Elliot justice. Hopefully, we'll do part two quite soon yeah. because um, there's some really powerful stuff uh, to talk about, and I think the the poem does build a a kind of um, frenetic momentum towards the end. Um, so hopefully, look out for that, and look out for uh, our friend academic agent on the Pete Quinones Quinones show. There's no show. Uh, look out for Panama Hat <laughs> on um, whatever Panama Hat does. I have I have my own channel. I'll be He's doing... got his channel. Yeah, I've he got did a video I've got on things... Mishima. Yes, the Mishima video. I've got more things coming out soon. There's a donations link. You can tip me. You can buy me a cup of coffee or a cup of tea, uh, and the link on my channel, which is very much appreciated. This this is apparently me, is it? I'm, I'd be this uh, villain. Let's look a bit. Like, it's, a, it's, not, it's not miserable enough to beat Panama Hat. But... No, I, I have such a hangdog face. This is, couldn't get miserable as me. He, 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 he doesn't have my jowls, does he? I mean, you go. <laughs> <laughs> no, no jowls. No jowls. No. All right. Uh, all right, everyone. Thank you all for right. watching. And now, get out. Shanti. Shanti.